Live from FedEx Forum in the American Home Shield Studio. This is the Chris Vernon Show on GrindCityMedia.com. Presented by Direct Auto and Life Insurance. Now, here's your host, Chris Vernon. Good people, welcome to the Chris Vernon Show. Rob Fisher in for Chris Vernon today. We got a busy show for you today. Preseason football action in full gear last night. We'll go down all of the numbers from the preseason action last night. Yeah, that'll be exciting. Uh, That'll be coming up a little bit later on. Big news at the University of Memphis uh, this afternoon as well that we will get into. We got some NBA we'll talk about. Michael Wallace is going to join us. Coming up live from Las Vegas, he's going to join us where he is there with the uh, men's national team and had a great uh, piece on Taylor Jenkins and getting some uh, outsiders' opinions on Coach Jenkins and also has talked a lot with Jaron Jackson Jr., so we'll talk to Michael about those things. And uh, momentarily, Brad Jones, uh, assistant coach for the Memphis Grizzlies, last year's head coach of the Memphis Hustle. He's going to join us coming up on the program here in a little bit as well. Seems as though he's feeling a little bit better today, ladies and gentlemen. John Roser with me as well. You You look and sound more alive. I feel a million times better. You know, I uh, went to the doctor yesterday again, my second trip this week to the doctor. Uh, Blood pressure was not good. (laughs) I was nearing a stroke slash heart attack level. Sure. Blood pressure was 160 over 100 because I've been out of town like the entire month of July and this first part of August. And what have you been doing out of town? Uh, (laughs) Eating pizza and drinking alcohol. I have gained, going to the doctor yesterday, I have gained, I've gained 18 pounds since the beginning of July. Wow. Yeah, it is incredibly unhealthy, but I'm back in town for a long time now. I can start losing the weight. I got to. I'm in a wedding in September. Yeah. So we got yeah. to. We just got to gotta start eating vegetables, fish, and veggies, and we'll be good. Good. And we'll be good. 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 Looking forward to that. Uh, we will get into uh, all of those things coming up on the program today. Also, uh, I know you guys have talked a little bit about hard knocks uh, this week, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, maybe some other sports uh, being involved in some hard knocks uh, as well. Uh, so we'll do that coming up a little bit later on. But a pleasure to welcome to the program Brad Jones, assistant for the Memphis Grizzlies. How are you, Coach? I am absolutely terrific. Just ran up from the court to come up here and to be with you guys. Yeah. Has this summer been for you to get the opportunity to be on the Grizzlies bench, to go to summer league? You guys win a championship there and a lot of team unity there as well. It, it seems like it's, uh, it's probably been moving pretty fast for you. It has definitely been a summer of emotions, both up and down and mainly all good. But, uh, you know, from when the – you know, the hustle season wrapped up. It was such a successful season for the hustle. And, uh, you know, we were very excited about how that all played out. And then, um, you know, then obviously with the change in the coaching staff of the Grizzlies, that was obviously a low point. And, um, but then, you know, once again, you start the, the prep for the, you know, the John Morant pick and the, the lottery and, be, and being a part of that. And we, we had young guys in early in the summer as well. And um, so we had a big part. I had a big part in uh, working those guys out then. And then, the, you know, the draft into the summer league to hiring Coach Taylor, who was, you know, like I said, we will get into that later. But, you know, he's – we have a long history, and yeah. I'm so excited about that. And then the summer league was just uh, it was, it was a special time. It was fun, not only you know winning the championship, but the you know letting letting Taylor and Coach Jenkins you know lay his groundwork for his vision of where we're going to go. Um, and then and then having like you said, having Ja who didn't play a minute, and Jaron who didn't play a minute, and Dylan who didn't play a minute, be a part of it the whole time, and and, and you, you know, kind of step up and show some leadership and some excitement and some fun and. Uh, then it, obviously the championship, and then obviously Taylor wanted me to be a part of his staff. So it has been quite the summer, a lot of emotions, <laughs> and uh, most of them really, really good. And uh, it comes to this point where I'm, I'd be hard to find more a more excited person in Memphis than Brad Jones right now. I'm, <laughs> I am uh, super excited about what's going on and, and my opportunity here. Chris Harrington from the Daily Memphian wrote a great piece today uh, about your relationship with Taylor and how you got here. And and it seems though, even though you were the head coach of the Memphis Hustle last year. This year seems to be 
dream come true. I mean, this, this was something you envisioned a long, long time ago of a possibility. So back when the Grizzlies first moved here from Vancouver, um, and they were playing at the Pyramid, <laughs> I'm dating myself. Um, <laughs> the Bass was, Pro yeah, Shop. Yeah, 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 the, yeah, for those of you who know the Bass Pro <laughs> Shop now. But, um, uh, um, you know, I was coaching at Lambeth University um, up there in uh, Jackson. And, you know, I, I've had NBA ties for a lot of times, but I never worked in the NBA. But, you know, when they moved, it was like my dream job is like one day I would, you know, just like, you know, give a left finger for to be able to have a chance to work for the Memphis Grizzlies and it's been a I've had a great road in my coaching career don't get me wrong but uh, you know to be able to get all the way back to this point um, and be on the bench and not only with the Grizzlies but with Taylor Jenkins who's somebody I care for almost like a you know little brother I mean a family member um, it's just a dream come true for me so it's a like I said I I, I I get a little choked up talking about it still, so I'm so excited about being here. It's amazing your relationship with Taylor and how far goes back, and really throw Quinn Snyder uh, in mm -hmm. there as well. Yeah. You three have kind of been entangled, uh, and, and to see where you've all gone uh, throughout your careers is is pretty fascinating. So you first were with Taylor in Austin, yes, correct, and, yeah. and work. Quinn was the head coach at the time, and then when Quinn left for Atlanta, then you became the head yeah. coach? So I, I believe, so um, Quinn was the head coach with Taylor um, as an assistant. Um, it was Taylor's first year as an assistant from coming up from being an intern with the Spurs. Um, and then Quinn left to go, to, I believe, to Philly to be an, an assistant. Okay. Um, and then um, I came in to replace Quinn and uh, Taylor and actually Alex Lloyd, who also is with us in the hustle, um, were the assistants for Quinn the year before. And they both had a contract, so they asked me to keep them. So I kept them. I didn't know either one of them very well right. at all. Um, <laughs> And um, so we, we got off to our, our, our relationship that way. And um, uh, after the first year, and it, it, was the, it was the absolute worst year I've ever had as a head coach in the G League or really anywhere, to be honest. But, uh, and it wouldn't ha didn't have anything to do with Taylor or Alex. We just, you know, we, it, for whatever reason, G League has its ups and downs. And, um, but then we were able to come back, you know, after being together as a staff for a year, we kind of knew what was going on. Um, we, we kept our staff together going into the second year. And then um, we were able to, you know, one, we had nine NBA call-ups that year, and a lot of it has to do with, with Taylor and Alex and their player development on the court with the guys. Um, then we were also able to win a G League championship. So uh, it was a special year we had on the second year with all of us guys together. As a result of that, I, I got asked to go work for the Utah Jazz as assistant coach, um, and then they elevated Taylor to replace me. Right. Um, so it's funny because, you know, you start with Quinn, then me, and now Taylor, and then I'm working for Quinn, and now Taylor's here, and now, now I'm back working for Taylor. And it just, you know, it's all this, you know, hodgepodge of uh, the intertwine um, of it. But, uh, you know, Taylor did a great job in, in Austin as a coach, and then he went with uh, Coach Bodenhauser uh, to Atlanta. You know, and they obviously had a great run in Atlanta, and now they're in Milwaukee, and and then I, uh, you know, I left Utah, and I was in Minnesota, and now I'm the hustle coach, and now Taylor comes, and then boom, here I am. <laughs> so how about that, huh? So it's kind of in a nutshell, yeah, uh, how, it all, how it all happened. Uh, we'll talk a lot more about Taylor in a second, but I want to ask you about Quinn Snyder. I, mm -hmm. I grew up in St. Louis. I worked in St. Louis. I covered the Missouri Tigers when mm -hmm. Quinn was there. Obviously, it did not go well for Quinn. And, mm -hmm. you know, he was the rising star out of Duke. He was the face of, you know, Mike Krzyzewski put him out there as the face mm -hmm. of the program. And. He takes the Missouri job, didn't go well for a number of reasons. And then to see where his career went and, you know, following and covering that Missouri team. First of all, the best press conference I've ever saw in my life. When <laughs> Quinn Snyder was introduced as the Missouri coach, uh -huh. I've never seen more co-eds at a press conference <laughs> in my life. And when he introduced his wife, just the gasp in the room. Ah, <laughs> oh, it was unbelievable. But then he goes and... I remember working with the Grizzlies and moving to Memphis, and I, we were at Staples Center and seeing Quinn walk down the hallways carrying equipment bags. And mm -hmm. I stopped him and talked to him, and I was like, boy, he's, he's not giving up. And he's, he's going back and, and just trying to work his way back. And when he got hired by the Utah Jazz, I was surprised that, that it, it seemed to happen almost quickly for him to get mm -hmm. that opportunity. But I'm even more surprised and stunned how great of a job he's done with the Utah Jazz. What, what did you learn under him? What did you see in him that it makes him the coach that he is? Well, so first of all, you, know, you, you kind of mentioned the fact that his perseverance, um, you know, he was the, the, the rising star yeah. and then kind of got knocked back. And, um, you know, he, he's very open about, you know, there were times when he got knocked back. He was wondering if I'm even going to be able to continue to coach. Right. And, uh, and he decided to, you know, stay through, stay through the course and, you know, went to the G League and, you know, worked his way back up. And, uh, you know, so to me, that's the number one thing about him is just his perseverance um, and how, how, how focused and directed he is at, at what he wants to get done. Um, but ha having said that, 
working with the guy is like you go into a classroom every day of basketball. Um, you know, being in the coaches' meetings, being on the practice court. Uh, I can't I can't tell you how much X and O stuff I learned from him. He's just he, I, I call him like a mad scientist. He's just unbelievable. He's not afraid to try new things, right? And they're you know they're well thought out. It's not like he's just throwing stuff against the wall. They're right. they're very well thought out, and he sits up and you know draws stuff, and then they, you know they eventually you know he. But we ran a play one night as an ATO. Um, and uh, it was something that was a kind of a different thing that you don't see in the NBA a lot. And we scored off it, and I kind of jabbed him and I said, man, that was awesome. He goes, I've been thinking about that for four years. <laughs> <laughs> so kind of tells you who yeah. he is. He's and, uh, probably written around a lot of plays on Napoli. <laughs> <laughs> right? No, amen. So uh, brilliant, brilliant coach. Like I said, I learned a lot uh, working with him. Yeah, and then you've worked with Taylor a lot, as we mentioned, mm-hmm. and Taylor was very young uh, as an yeah. assistant on your staff. What did you see in him then? Well, so the first thing I saw was a passion. Like, he, like Taylor – came to work every day just like ready to rip his shirt off and go right Right. I mean he just he just loved being a basketball coach um the second thing I saw was he to this day and I've I've seen a lot I I, hopefully I'm not leaving anybody out but he's probably the most organized guy I've ever been around and as as you know being around Rob the NBA like you have so many people work for you like that's that's an un unknown skill of a head coach has to have right right i mean you know taylor has how many people that on a daily basis waits for him to put something in place so that we all even you guys right i right. mean i mean yeah. so uh i think all you guys and our players everybody will love the fact that like he it's gonna be you're gonna know when and where and what's going on and uh, i think when you have that kind of stability and that type of organization it allows everybody to do their job better um, so I think you'll see that in him. Um, and then the, the other thing that he's really, really evolved with, and, and this is not a knock on when he was younger, but like he was 23, 24 years old when I worked with him the first time, is he, he has learned uh, the value of relationships. Um, and uh, like I said, not that he didn't have it then, but like he, he spent as much time, and it's probably a little bit hyperbole, but he spent a ton of time uh, during the summer league uh, like taking guys to lunch, sitting with them after practice, you know, just sitting talking to them, getting to know them uh, so that he can put himself in a good situation to put them in a good situation. And uh, I think that's something that goes behind the scenes that people don't realize, but he's a very much, and he said it in his press conference, but he's a relationship guy. And um, so I think those three things are going to put him in a great place. And then obviously the style of play is going to be a little bit different than, you know, what the Grizzly fans are used to. But, uh, you know, it's, it's more of the trend of what's going on in the NBA now. And uh, he – he puts guys in positions, and he tells them this. He, he puts guys in position. We're going to play within a system, but I also want you to go out there and be you and be great at being you. Yeah, and and it's fascinating. And when you talk about relationships, it's, it's got to be hard as a coach, and you've been in this position as well, when you want to build these relationships because players change all the time and, and you know, coaching staffs change and yeah. jobs change, and mm-hmm. it seems it can happen very quickly. So to build that, you have to build it quickly. No, totally. And that, I think that's part of where he's, you know, he feels like he's got a window here, the honeymoon stage to, to get to know everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, and he's really, like I said, he, you know, when, when Jonas flies in from Lithuania, like the next morning they're having breakfast, right? right. I mean, right away, right? Just so they can get to know each other and have, have a, you know, a two-way street, right? Of open communication. And so I, he really, I don't, he didn't tell me this, but like I could tell that, that building those relationships with the players um, and the people whole, around the whole Grizzly organization was like one of his top priorities. I mean, obviously right behind putting the, you know, the system in and whatever else, but he, he spent a lot of time doing it. And I, I think one, it's a tribute to him, but I also think it'll pay off going forward because I think the players, you know, now it's, it's not this mystery of who this guy is, right? right? They, 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 they know who he is. They have a confidence level that he cares about them um, and, he, and a confidence level that he's going to try to put them in positions to go be succeed and, and have their best interest at heart. So I, it was high on his priority list of, of developing that. Did you think early on that this is a, this is a guy, he, he'll be a head coach someday? You know, I feel that about all my all yeah. my guys. I'm I'm a bit biased, yeah, so uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm probably not sure. the guy to ask that because I'm going to say, yeah, dude, I, yeah. Knew, I knew right away the minute I saw him. But uh, um, you know what? He, he I knew right away he had the building blocks of being a really successful coach uh, just in in all my years of doing this, um, and then getting to go to Atlanta and you know a lot of the, I mean, and this don't take this as a knock on Taylor. But a lot of this is that all of us are good coaches. You just got to kind of get in a good situation, you know. And he went with Bud, who was you know, the hop guy, and they got to Atlanta and did you know did a great job in Atlanta, and you know then they end up going to Milwaukee and they get this guy named Giannis and and, they, and to their credit they took good players and put them in situations to be successful yeah. and so I think that's what Taylor has learned is I think he's gonna you know and, and it's gonna take us steps obviously but like you know Jaron Jackson he's gonna put him in a position to be successful right he you know John Morant he's gonna put him in a situation to be successful right Kyle Anderson he's gonna put him in a situation to be successful and I think that's what he's learned through the course of his being around the Spurs and you know and, and coach Budenholzer and now coming here to start his plan. With your season with the Memphis Hustle, what what did what'd you take from that season? What did you learn from that season? And 
just from the guys that you had, your preparation there, and also with that working relationship with the Grizzlies and being so close? Well, first of all, uh, th this is an unbelievable, unique, and positive and productive situation that you have here with the Memphis Grizzlies and their relationship with the Memphis Hustle, right? I mean, we're, our, our offices are in the same building, which right. is this building is in. <laughs> um, you know, back with Coach Bickerstaff and, and the previous uh, front office, like, they, it's paramount that we have connection, interactions, and synergy between both groups. And you know, I've been in and out of the G League and, um, you know, been on both sides of it, and you know, the, it, people always say that, but it doesn't always happen that way. And I was, it, one, that was on the outside looking in when I came here was very exciting for me. But when I got into it, being here and seeing the inner workings, it was even better than I thought. I mean, like, like for instance, they would, they would call me, um, you know, and say, we're going to send Ivan Rab to play for the hustle tonight. And I'm like, oh, great. <laughs> and then they would say, um, yeah, but we, we want him playing on the perimeter, right? I mean, this is, I mean, you know, they would be very direct, right? right? And then it would be on me. I'd say, well, thank you. As long as, you, as long as I know what you want, I can go do that. Now, you know, Ivan looked at me crazy when the first day he showed up. He's never practiced with us. And I said, tonight you're going to shoot five threes. He, went, <laughs> <laughs> he shot three that night, made two of them, by the way. But I didn't, we never got quite to five. But I told him, your job is every night to shoot five threes when you play for the hustle, right? right? And we're going to extend you and, you know, try to push you to, you know, get better. And then not only the threes, but then we had him bring the ball up the floor after free throws in the middle of the floor and make, have him make plays because that, that was part of his player development plan. So that, that example is kind of what we have here with the Memphis hustle and the Memphis Grizzlies. And I know it's going to continue to be, you know, as good as it was or even better going forward uh, with Coach March coming in because he's, he's been around, right? He knows, um, you know, he's been a part of Sacramento and then obviously here, um, so he knows, and I look forward to getting um, – I know him pretty well, but I've never worked with him. So but, um, um, I look forward to getting him in here and, and uh, you know, having him carry out that same mission because the G League is such an unbelievable resource for NBA teams. It, it's just amazing. There's so many different things, um, you know, that you can, you can have it used for. And when you have the access and the connectivity that we have here in Memphis, it's just it's, – it's even better. Yeah. And I talked – or I heard Coach March uh, in a radio interview, he's going to be blowing up your phone. Mm -hmm. So he's already, he's already talking about blowing up your phone. We, we have already spent a lot of time <laughs> on the phone. And I, you know, he's on uh, – he's with his family today, and he'll be in Monday. And I look forward to sitting down with him and uh, help put him in a position to be successful. So because, uh, like I said, it, it, we're very fortunate to have the situation we have here. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting offseason for the Grizzlies because, you know, you go through a seven-year playoff run where every offseason was, all right, let's, let's try and get a little bit better in free agency and in the draft, and then you, you get excited about how far you can go the next year, and then now the last few years have been a little different. But this is the one offseason that I can remember in all my years with the team that there's so much excitement about a team that not many people are expecting to make the playoffs <laughs> – but there's so much excitement about it because there's a there's a vision, there's a hope, and there's a young crew, and it is a turning of the page of what we are used to of Memphis Grizzlies basketball. Is that excitement also with the coaching staff of what you have in place and anxious to get started? Absolutely, I think um, you know, I, I think the reason you hire a guy like Taylor Jenkins is to come into this situation, right? I mean, if they're still trying to piece it together and you know stay the eight or seven seed, then maybe Taylor's not the guy for this job at this moment. Right. Um, so when they when they do the reset and they you know they bring a guy like Taylor in who's young and full of energy and and, and player development um, ideas. Um, you know, it, it, you get excited about it. And you, then you have the draft pick where not only you get number two, you get a, a, a super talented job. It's like Jaw's personality and engagement and, and what type of person he is may be even better than he is as a basketball player. So that, that starts to build, right? Then you got Jaron Jackson who just basically, you know, we, you talk about when we want to be resources to guys that during right. the offseason. Well, Jaron's been in Memphis, like, like unbelievable amounts this summer. And like every, he's, he's, he's calling one and get two days in. I'm like, Jaron, okay, let's slow down. <laughs> we, I mean, we love it. But so to have those kind of guys to build that excitement um, it is great. Um, you know, I think those can kind of be some of the building blocks along with Taylor's vision. But, you know, I, I, I went through this in Utah, right, and uh, where we, you know, we had – almost identical we had you know eight older guys that they decided okay we're going to let them go we're going right. to start anew um and uh i think the thing that we have to understand is it is exciting and it is for the coaching staff and i know it's, it's amazing when i walk around memphis you know, i got kids so i got all i got all kind of things going on during the summer and like everybody's like super excited i'm like well you know we you know <laughs> we may not like win the championship this year and right like, oh no we don't care you know we're so i'm like oh that's great I, I hope they don't care in january but uh, <laughs> exactly but uh the, so the, the excitement is great but the one thing i think it's important for everybody to know is that you know i think this is going to be a longer process you know, when you talk to zach and and even what zach and those guys have done 
done in the front office and building the team as it is in, right now and then Taylor's vision. I mean, it, there's going to be steps. And there's, sometimes when we may be able to take two or three steps forward, we may take a step or two back. Um, and, and the way Greg Miller said it when we were in Utah is he goes, you know, there's going to be storm clouds. Right. I mean, right. It, it's sunny day right now. Right. Other than outside. the moment, no, Except but, today. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but it's sunny day for the grizzly outlook and everything um, right now. But, you know, when we get in. There's going to be hard times and there's going to be storms and like some storms will be really rough. And the, the idea is when you get in those storms, you just can't panic. You got to, you know, stay. Storms go away. Right. Right. As long as you don't let them affect your vision and your focus. So I, I, I just. I know I'm a little bit of the coach here managing the expectations, but uh, as exciting as everything is, you know, there's going to be storm clouds, and, and I know that I know Taylor won't, and I don't think Zach and those guys will. And I just hope our fans will stay with us, and we're going to get through those storm clouds so that, you know, hopefully in two or three years here, we got something really special that, you know, we can have another seven or eight-year run of what they just got through. I've never been around a coach that didn't have a pen in his pocket and a coach that's just not always thinking of plays and ready to grab something and write a play down. I mentioned it with Quinn earlier about writing mm -hmm. on napkins. I've seen plenty of coaches write plays on napkins. Yeah. What's the weirdest thing? you've written a play on well actually i've been uh, i'm going to switch it a little bit uh, I, I was we did our family vacation last week and uh, i was sitting on the beach with my family trying to stay in the shade by the way because i get sunburned <laughs> going across the parking lot um and all of a sudden i'm sitting there thinking about the great opportunity we have with jaron jackson and john morant and uh and i'm thinking oh my gosh you know what we can do you know how everybody does all the big and I, i'm getting a little technical now but you know the big which jaron can play on the perimeter to like the the little quick guard and jaw and, uh, ja, who can like come off turn a corner and like get the lobs or whatever sure. else so I, I was thinking just about different ways to do it and all of a sudden it hit me what if we inverted it because jaron is such a unique talent right so like you can get jaw the ball maybe at the elbow like typically guys big guys get the ball mm -hmm. to elbow maybe get the guards on the wing and they go do something you get jaw the ball Right, and you put Jaron like in the corner, a little maybe even inside, and then you do a little DHO there. What, how are they going to defend that? <laughs> I mean, I'm thinking, I don't know how you can do it. Like, I, I came in Monday, I was like, well, look at this, we got it. So, <laughs> always <laughs> thinking of plays. Oh, it was great. I mean, no, it's just you think about, you think about how you put your guys in good situations. Right? That's the right. whole idea as a coach is we want to put guys in positions where they can go be these freaking great guys and athletes that they are. And uh, so, um, that, that, that was one of my, like I said, it's, it's on my mind right now. So I've been thinking about that a lot this week. And the different things you can do out of it. There's actually variations sure. you can do out of it, too. So anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the coach that you've, you've seen that's brilliant drawing up plays that you've stolen from? Oh, Quinn Snyder. Quinn? Oh, yeah. He, he, like the, the, I'm telling you. The, I, I can't tell you how many plays that I've written down that he has that he's never even got to on the court yet. I right. mean, he's just unbelievable <laughs> on the board. I mean, the things he does is amazing. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, most brilliant coach that you have faced? Either G Ooh. League or seen Ooh. in the NBA. Uh, well, it's, I mean, it's got to be Coach Popovich. Yeah. Um, you know, just, just the the he has the whole package. He has the the system. He ha knows how to handle players and put them in a situation to be successful. He has a longevity. But one thing he has that people don't realize is the common sense. Like you know, he is. He, he puts guys and he in situations succeed and when they fail he doesn't panic a little bit like the storm cloud thing right. but he's he foresees all that and knows when to when to kick them and when to pat them on the back yeah uh, do, do you see you know guys who come from the pop tree all have that same sort of mentality the ones that want to be successful do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they should yeah, yeah take it away from them right yeah uh smartest player smartest player you've coached oh smartest player i've coached um, well, I didn't really coach him, but I was around him as John Stockton. Um, yeah. I didn't. I was part of the scouting staff when he was there, but that's an easy one. Uh, smartest player I've coached. I got. I got a lot of good ones. Um, I, I got to tell you one that's on the top of my mind that is an interesting one that most people wouldn't say is uh, it'd be the guy who coaches here in the G League who just signed overseas is uh, Tyler Harvey. Really? Uh, yeah, he really thinks the game. Um, really, really good at. I mean, he's, he's not the quickest guy in the world. He has a shot that's kind of a little funny, and uh, but yet he can score 58 points in a, in a G League game, and, and I'm such a bad coach that we lost that game. <laughs> guy can play basketball just because he's smart. I yeah, mean, yeah more not because we got a coach that scores 58 and we lose. <laughs> like, who does that? Uh, the, think, <laughs> thank goodness Taylor didn't know about that game. He may not have hired me. <laughs> hardest, hardest worker that you've uh, coached? No doubt Lance Thomas. Really? Lance Thomas, well, how about this? A great story. Lance Thomas was a second-round pick in the G League. Not in the NBA. Right. In the G League. We picked him in Austin as a second-round pick. And uh, I've, I've never been around somebody f so focused and so driven uh, to make his team and himself better. Um, and, uh, you know, then he goes, it, obviously, through the ups and downs of it, he, he gets called up. Um, 
you know, bounces around, right, bounces around, and then he signs a seven-year, $28 million contract with the New York Knicks as a, from a, being a second-round pick in the G League. I text him that day, and I say, congratulations. America's a great place. <laughs> <laughs> so, but he, he's by far. Like, I, I, the laser focus I've ever – I mean, I, yeah. he's unbelievable. A uh, guy in the G League, even last year, the, was there a guy that stands out that you're like, boy, I can't believe he hasn't made it in the league? Ooh. You know, there's a lot of them. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of them that, that are It's a fine around. line, isn't it? Um, but one I'll just go ahead and get. Oh, total fine line. And a lot of it's just kind of like timing, right? I right. mean, you know, so many things that get this way and that way. And uh, one of them is uh, <laughs> it ends up, and hopefully he's going to make it in the league, was, um, you know, Bruno. You know, we, we played against Bruno, I think, the last game before he got called up by the Grizzlies. Right. And I was, like, I had just got done. So we were down in, in, uh, in McAllen playing RGV. And, like, I had just barely got done talking to the team. And I go to my office, and my phone's ringing. And it's, uh, it's Chris Wallace. And he's like, tell me about Bruno. I mean, you know. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I think he just made seven threes against us. So, <laughs> so I was like, sign him. <laughs> but uh, um, you know, Bruno has a lot of pieces. And, you know, obviously he's the, you know, the, the quintessential, you know, young guy who, you know, maybe was a little ahead of him when he got drafted. You know, he, he was too, too fast for him. Right. Uh, they had his bounce back. And then to his credit, he, you know, fought it. Now he's hopefully back to stay, um, you know, with the, with, the, with the Grizzlies. But, uh just, you know, he's 6'10", and he's got arms that he doesn't have to bend over to tie his shoes. He can shoot. I mean, he just um, – so he was one at the time, and I, I, like, I, hope, I hope I'm wrong on that. I hope he has made it now because, um, you know, he's a great kid, and he's had a good summer. He's worked hard up here when he's been in and out of town too. Yeah, well, training camp is going to be here before you know it. So I'm sure you're excited to get going for real. Absolutely. I wish it was here tomorrow. Let's go. <laughs> well, Coach, thanks so much for your time today. Appreciate right. it a lot. Thank you're you. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. All right, Brad Jones, uh, assistant coach for the Memphis Grizzlies, joining us. We'll take a break here on the Chris Vernon Show. We'll come back. Michael Wallace is going to join us from Vegas when we return here on the Chris Vernon Show. Jim Gaffigan, Secrets and Pies Tour. Have you been to one of the weddings where the groom removes the girder belt from the bride and flings it to a crowd of perverts? Who came up with that one? Hey, you know how the bride throws the bouquet? How about something for the fellas? Maybe the bride's on the way. Jim Gaffigan, Saturday, August 17th, FedEx Forum. Reserve seats on sale now at the FedEx Forum box office or online at Ticketmaster.com. The Live Love Memphis group can be found at LiveLoveMemphisHomes.com. They are the best real estate agents in Memphis. Jennifer Karstensen and her team, they sold over 165 houses in 2016. They're going to sell more than that this year. If you know you need to sell a house soon, if you've been trying to sell a house for a long time, if you've had a sign in your yard way too long, or you know in the future you're going to need to, because uh, you're going to have to be moving or uh, you maybe even have to move out of town. Get with Jennifer and her team and let them sell your house because they sell these houses for the most money possible the quickest. And that's what you want from a real estate agent. They sell for the most money possible in the quickest amount of time. A home in Bartlow is on the market for just four hours, closed in 30 days. And here's the deal. Through their proven marketing systems, they may already have your buyer. You can contact them for a list of families actively looking for properties who haven't been able to find a match. Find them online, livelovememphishomes.com, livelovememphishomes.com. Rowling over your car insurance, Grizz fans? Here's something to really wave your growl towel about. Direct Auto and Life Insurance can get you the coverage you need, the services you want, and the respect you deserve regardless of your driving history. Direct makes it easy for you to manage your insurance and get a free quote whenever you want. Score big savings with their flexible payment options, low rates, and discounts. To learn more about all of their pleasant surprises, call 1-877-GO-DIRECT, click, or come into any of their local stores. In today's healthcare environment, it's important to be your own champion. If you've suffered an injury or have aches and pains, physical therapy can make all the difference. Choose Select Physical Therapy to get back in the game as the official athletic training and physical therapy service provider for your Memphis hustle. Select's clinical team provides the best care. Request an appointment today at selectphysicaltherapy.com. Select has more than 20 convenient locations in Tennessee. The hustle choose Select Physical Therapy, so can you. Select 
Select Physical Therapy, the power of physical therapy. Join up, Grizz Nation. Pick up the best seats at the best prices to see your Grizz face the Lakers, Warriors, and more with Grizzlies 2019-20 season tickets. MVP season ticket members get exclusive access to events, seat upgrades, discounts on gear, and more. Plus, place a 10% deposit on next season and get a free John ja Morant jersey. Season tickets start at $9 per game. Call 901-888-HOOP or click grizzlies.com to purchase your seats today. Welcome back to the Chris Vernon Show on GrindCityMedia.com. Brought to you by Direct Auto and Life Insurance. Live from the American Home Shield Studio inside FedEx Forum. Be sure with the shield and go to AHS.com today for your free no-obligation home warranty quote. Now, back to your host, Chris Vernon. Now we find ourselves in late December. Hey, Grizz Nation, 2019, 25th season for the Grizzlies franchise and bound to be one for the ages. They got early bird single game tickets going on sale for 48 hours starting Monday, August 12th at 3 p.m. That'll be about an hour after the schedule is released as well. So uh, got tickets uh, going on sale, the early bird single game tickets going on sale 48 hours starting Monday, August 12th at 3 p.m. Secure your seats to see the Grizzlies young core compete all season long during the 48 hour sale by shopping at grizzlies.com. Welcome back to the Chris Vernon Show. Rob Fisher in for Chris today. He'll be back to the program on Monday. Uh, just got done visiting with uh, Brad Jones, assistant coach for the Memphis Grizzlies. Great treat to visit with him. And an unbelievable tangled web between him, Taylor Jenkins, Quinn Snyder, and how they just kept moving yeah. around constantly. And uh, pretty remarkable stuff. And uh, great stuff uh, with Brad here this afternoon. Uh, Michael Wallace, our own Michael Wallace. I'm going to start calling him Mr. Vegas. Vegas Wallace. No kidding. How about that? Two, two trips or is, is it this, two or yeah, more? Yeah, two. two tri- this is the second trip. Man. Mr. Vegas. Grind City Media's own. You can catch him on Twitter at my Mike Check. Michael Wallace joins us. Hello, Michael. Hey, man. Listen, it, it's not really Vegas if you don't stay on the strip this time. So I've, I've been strip free. Oh, good. Um, I'm actually I'm actually staying out in the Summerlin area. Rob, you know where that is. Oh, I, yeah. I know you've been up here. Yeah, so. Um, I'm up here purposely, um, you know, trying to save a few bucks here and there, but also uh, <laughs> save the company a few bucks here and there. But also, um, it's a nice resort up here, man, and it's uh, it's it's cheaper than a strip hotel, so it's all good. Yeah, well, perfect. I hope the weather's good for you out there as well. Uh, it's just hot. Hot, you know I mean? it's hot, it's Vegas. spicy. Hot. Yeah, yeah, but it's a dry heat. It's a dry heat. So hey, you know what? So for bad. the first time in probably, I think it's been, I probably have come to Vegas maybe five times in my life, and. The other day was the first time it ever rained. Like I, I, that was the first time, and I didn't think it could rain in Vegas because it's such a dry, you know, dry uh, a landscape here. So I was shocked when it was uh, when I walked out of the uh, <laughs> the Thomas and Mack Center and the uh, Mendenhall Complex, man, and saw it rain. I was like, man, this this isn't supposed to happen, but it's all good though. I lived in Vegas for two years, and when it rains, it is like a natural disaster because. <laughs> Car, people don't know how to drive in the rain out there. I mean, you say that about every city. People don't know how to drive when it rains, especially. No, in Vegas, when it rains, people don't know what to do to the point where there are no sewers, streets get flooded, and cars just get swept down the street and swept away, and people freak out. It's unbelievable. So be careful if it's raining in Las Vegas. No, no, it, that was the only time. It was, it was that That's only good. day. That one good. day. I, I think I've been here since Tuesday uh, with Team USA. Uh, training camp and Jared Jackson obviously out here with the select team and uh yeah so it's it was that one day but otherwise it's been uh, it's been basically 103 every single day with sunshine yeah well perfect uh, I want to get to Jared in a moment but first you wrote a great piece about Taylor Jenkins as well and uh, you've gotten some uh, outside opinions uh, on Taylor Jenkins and a great piece that you have on Grind City Media um, young guy we just talked to Brad Jones uh, here on the show Michael and you know his relationship goes way back with Taylor Jenkins and he saw him as a young 23-year-old, and Greg Popovich saw him as a young 23-year-old, too. And, you know, Pop sees something he likes in you. That's, that's pretty high praise. Oh, no question about it, man. And I had a chance to, uh, to talk to Popovich about it. Um, you know, it, it's, it's about five or six people here uh, in Vegas with, with Team USA, whether player or coaches, uh, have had experiences with Taylor. And I figured, you know, obviously I'm out here for Jern primarily, but there's all kind of other stories that you can pull uh, that have Grizzly sort of connections to it. And, you know, one of the things Pop said was that, listen, like, you know, th- there's it, Pop doesn't like talking about the pipeline as it relates to him celebrating him, but he loves talking about the pipeline when it comes to, you know, the the, the guys that, that, that came through it. And, and he was talking, 
you know, about several of these guys. And then I slipped in a question about, you know, Jenkins. And, you know, he went on. And, and you know, pop, pop, the pop that you see on the sideline <laughs> in-game interviews, you know, that's the one that you cringe at, you know, and, and that kind of thing. But, you know, when you're talking to him about, you know, engaging things and you put some thought and some research into what you're asking him, um, he could talk for days about stuff like that, and, and, and he's great. And, you know, he, he said Taylor was, was, was a guy that you knew early on in the piece – I talk about this, that, that you knew early on as an intern that he has something about him with the way he could communicate with guys and get guys around him who are older uh, to respect every word that comes out of his mouth. So he knew once he transitioned to a coaching situation, you know, coaching the G League team in Austin for the Spurs, that it, it was going to translate. And, and that's the thing that you hear from person to person about Taylor is that he has a way to communicate with guys that gets his message and his knowledge and his vast intelligence across but he also does it in a practical way uh, that, that allows guys to perform and simply go out and do their job. So he's done that in Austin under San Antonio. He did it, you know, when he went to, Mil- uh, when he went to Atlanta with Mike Budenhoser and, uh, and last season um, in Milwaukee. So, you know, between Popovich and Chris Middleton and Brooke Lopez with Milwaukee and also John Collins, uh, the rising young star forward uh, for the Hawks, I talked to all of those guys about Taylor and, and, uh, you know, they've had nothing but good and interesting things to say about how he goes about doing his job. So check out that piece on uh, grindcitymedia.com. It's up there right now. And uh, I had fun doing it, but it also tells you a lot more than you probably knew about Taylor Jenkins coming in. Including, uh, I like Chris Milton had great things to say about him, including that uh, Taylor Jenkins apparently a heck of a get-back coach. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the, the, at that t- and I couldn't get it in there, but clearly he's the guy with a buck stopped there. It stopped at him, <laughs> and, uh, and and they joked about him. And, and you know, I, I get into the piece with with Chris saying that you know they're going to be looking around for Taylor the moment the first time that somebody <laughs> takes down a hard foul or or something goes on on the court. They're going to be looking for Taylor because that was his job, and you know he took that job seriously. So it was one of those things where he saved that saved a lot of guys money. And, uh, and and they loved it, you know what I mean? They loved that in him. And, um, you know, they're all – listen, man, they, he was with a championship contending team last year. And then the transition to a team that's obviously retooling uh, and, and is going to be going through a, a bit of a rebuild around some young guys, uh, that's not easy to do. But because Jenkins has been in every single position imaginable in, in every single circumstance, uh, it's something that he can easily transition from. And that's what came across – uh, from from the difference between from what Middleton and Brooke Lopez was saying to what John Collins was saying, because obviously that Hawks team uh, in, in Jenkins' last year there with, with Budenhoser, they were a rebuilding team at that point too. And you've seen what, what John Collins did last year. He's one of the handful of guys to average 20 and 10 in his second NBA season. So you hope that he can have that same kind of impact with a guy like Jaron Jackson and sort of unleash him as well. You've spent a lot of time, obviously, with Jaron uh, in Las Vegas as well. What What has stood out to you? Man, just the, uh, the the calmness. I mean, this is a guy that's still 19. He's 19. He, like, when you think about it, Jaron isn't a guy that loves being in Vegas. Like, <laughs> that's the one thing that jumps out every time. Like, we have our little routine now where, you know, when I came and saw him on Tuesday, I was like, look, I'm going to be here all week with you, and we're going to sit down, and we're going to talk, and, you know, just tell me what's going on in your mind. I mean, not everything has to be on the record, but I just want to see how you're, pro- you know, processing everything. And, and the funny thing is, like, you know, the basketball part of it, he's actually locked in and engaged and loving it. Um, but Vegas just isn't a place where he can enjoy as a 19-year-old, it, it seems like. I mean, obviously it sounds funny saying that, but, but you, you see that, you know, this is a guy that, and, and I didn't get this into any of the pieces. I'll probably do this in some of the video stuff I do today. Um, but he's been on the road since, uh, uh, you know, June 30th, basically, since the team went off to Salt Lake City for summer league. Jaron Jackson has not been back in Memphis for any sustained time. So he's been working on his game, working out, going across the country, doing all of these different high-end uh, workouts. He was in New York a couple of weeks ago doing those Carmelo Anthony, Chris Paul workouts uh, at that Lifetime Center. He was with Dwayne Wade in the uh, elite camp, uh, training camp with, with a lot of young prospects and a lot of young NBA stars that was there with Dwayne Wade. Uh, then he came back to Vegas for this. Um, he went to Michigan for a minute uh, to work out with – you know, Miles Bridges and some of the Michigan State guys who went back there to, to catch up with Izzo. So he's been gone for a long time, and, and he's looking forward to getting back to Memphis, but he has one more thing to do tonight uh, in that blue and white scrimmage. But he's been great all week. How is, uh, you know, there, there's so much talk, obviously, about this team, about who's not there. But around the yeah. team, I mean, what, what's, what, what's their mindset? What, what are they, you know, obviously they don't want to talk about it. They don't want to hear about it. They're, they're there, and they want to represent their country. They, they do, and, 
and and to a man, they all are saying that. I mean, when I, you know, when you look at Donovan Mitchell, I mean, this guy is is standing out among all of these guys um, in terms of you know superstar level. He wouldn't back down no matter who was here or who wasn't here. Now, obviously, you know, you want the elite guys. You want the the you know the Steph Curry's and the Kevin. I mean, obviously Kevin. You know, Durant can't play; he's hurt. But you know, a lot of those you know front end guys have backed out the Dame Lillards and all that. But you know what? That's fine because you know when you look at a Kimba Walker and when you look at a Donovan Mitchell. Um, you know, the guys from Boston right now, Tatum and, and, and Brown. And, you know, even when you go a little bit deeper than that, some of the role players uh, that you have on this team, I mean, Middleton is, a, is an all-star at this point. So they still feel like they have enough talent. And this is perfect for Greg Popovich because now he doesn't necessarily, not to say that he would have done this, but he doesn't necessarily have to cater to, you know, certain guys wanting more minutes and wanting their regular role that they would have, you know, with their home teams and all of those kind of things. These are all coachable guys that will, will run through a brick wall for them. And then when you, you know, when you look at some of these guys like Marcus Smart and, you know, some of the other guys that are on this team that know how to play their roles, you know, um, this is something that he can, he, can, he can benefit from. So I think this team is going to be stronger than what people think. I do think the world teams out there, especially Lithuania um, with our guy Jonas Valanciunas and, you know, a couple other teams are going to be hard to go up against. Um, but having said all of that, I, I still think this is going to be one of the better teams uh, in the field when they open up play in, uh, in the FIBA World Cup later this month in China. And what a great opportunity for these players. Um, I, I think it's great experience for them. I mean, you know, you go back and when Rudy Gay was just working out with the United States team and when Mike Conley has had workouts with the United States team, I, I mean, I just think those experiences are huge for these players. To be around other great players, to be around different NBA players, to be around a coach like Greg Popovich, I, I think it's just a great experience. It, it, it is, it is, and, and I know we normally save our our name droppings for uh, for our segment three on the on the TV broadcast. Right. We'll be getting to that in a couple more minutes. I mean, a couple more months. Right. But I, I remember talking to uh, to Kobe Bryant and 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 Dwayne Wade about what their experience around one another meant uh, during that 2008 Olympic team, and you know, just the fact that you know superstars get to see how other superstars work out every single day. You know what I mean? I, I remember um, Chris Bosh. You know, and, and Dwayne and, and LeBron, for that matter, the, the Heat's big three were telling me that, you know, and I think I told this story before, you know, 2008 workout for Team USA. Uh, I think that was the Beijing Olympics. And, you know, they show up for the first meeting for uh, Coach K. I mean, the very first training camp meeting when they were working out, um, the meeting started at like 8 o'clock. And the players were coming, you know, waking up, coming downstairs um, from their hotel suites and everything and going to get, eat breakfast and, to start their meeting. You know, Chris Bosh said, man, I was coming down the steps in my house shoes, yawning, stretching, uh, just waking up. And they said they looked through a side door. Kobe Bryant comes in from the side door with his knees taped, sweat-drenched shirt with two trainers. Kobe had already been working out for two hours. He had already done his workout for two hours before that um, while the rest of this room. And so everybody in the room sort of looked over at Kobe and was like, wow, that's what this is about. You know what I mean? And, and that's what separates Kobe at that time in his peak from the rest of the guys that were there. And, and, you know, so when you see something like that, when you're around other guys like that, that's what Jaron talked about. That's the one thing that Jaron is soaking up. He's seeing how, you know, a Donovan Mitchell is going about doing his job. He's seeing how, you know, some of the other players are putting in the extra work and the shooting and things of that nature. He's seeing all of those things, like what a professional being around a guy like a Thad Young uh, at this stage of his career uh, still means to have that USA across his chest. So when Jaron is in that environment, not to mention the coaches that are around here, you know, Coach K just r walks through. Brad Stevens is walking through. Greg Popovich is there all the time. Steve Kerr is there all the time. Van Gundy's there all the time. He's getting exposed to elite level greatness, um, and I think he can only you can only bring things back. Uh, even if it's one or two things he brings back, it's going to be uh, instrumental in terms of his development. Great use of house shoes, by the way, a term that's just not used <laughs> enough anymore. I, I know that for sure. Uh, Gabby Union, have any any thoughts on that too? Your friend, your personal close friend. Hey, hey, I stretched out my, uh, you know, I mean, my repertoire, man. Yeah, I got plenty more good. more than that. So that I, I got to catch up with her to see how that show is going. She's got a new show coming out. <laughs> okay. um, you know, that's why they moved out to L.A., you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to catch up with her as we get to L.A. Uh, with it still not being the who's not there, with it still being who's not there and who is there, mm -hmm. they're still all NBA players. USA should still be the best team when it's all said and done, shouldn't they? They should. I mean, they, they, they certainly should. I, I still think, and, and it's, it's obviously patriotism and a little bit of nationality bias, but, I mean, I still think the NBA players 
are the best players in you know in, in the world right now. And but the world is right there. I mean, like I said, I mean when you look at you know what this Serbian team um, is potentially can put together with the Bogdanoviches and obviously the Marko Guduric, uh, who the Grizzlies just signed. You know, I mean he's a good shooter on that team. But you know when you look at you know Nico. Uh, 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 Jokic is on that team as well. I mean, you have Boban Marjanovic. I mean, you have guys that on the Serbia team that have NBA playing experience at an elite level. You go yeah. over to Lithuania and you see those guys, the Sabonises and the Valanciunas. You see that team developing. And, you know, even with a, a team like Japan, you know what I mean, with Yuta being there, but you also have, you know, Rui. And, and, and Rui is a guy that, you know, is, is coming into this league and, and is, is destined to be a superstar. So there's going to be competition. And the reason why I say this is going to be, it's not going to be easy, is because the teams that Jaron has been on, the select teams going against the U.S. national roster, have held their own every single day. There hasn't been a day gone by where they hadn't even, they hadn't at least won two quarters of a scrimmage. Or, or at least tied a few quarters of the scrimmages that they've played. So that's what we'll see tonight, too. You'll see some competitive nature. Like, Pop stacked the team, though, in, in, in the, uh, in the uh, blue team's favor because the white team now um, is, is going to be without, you know, a couple of key guys. I mean, but Marvin Bagley is going to move up. Um, you know, uh, uh, Derek White is going to move up. So the white team that Jaren's going to be on won't have a lot of depth in terms of point guard or depth, but they're, they're going to have a chance to play and, and look good out there too. You mentioned Carmelo Anthony. What, you know, and Carmelo had his, um, you know, his quotes last week about what happened in Houston and, and where his career is, and right now his career is yeah. nowhere. Why, why wouldn't he play for Team USA? Why wouldn't they want him? You know, Colangelo's here. He's the managing director. Um, it was a great piece that, that, you know, my friend Michael Lee, uh, Michael Lee with The Athletic now, uh, sat down with Colangelo on Tuesday. And, and Colangelo basically, you know, said it. He said, listen, man, uh, you know, with the way this team is right now, um, they really couldn't, they really didn't want to deal with the dis- disruption. They really didn't want to deal with uh, the potential distraction of having a Carmelo Anthony and the storylines being about Carmelo. Uh, when they're trying to get these guys uh, together, you know, lesser heralded superstars or lesser heralded stars uh, to bond and be together. I mean, he felt like Carmelo would have been a standoff, standalone kind of guy. And it would have been more of a favor for Carmelo than actual team building uh, for the team. You know, so I, I can understand why. I mean, if you want to go and you want to go younger and build through the select team, now having said that, Carmelo did play for Team USA. He did help him win a gold medal. Um, he has been in the pipeline, so it's not like you're doing him a favor and giving him something that he hadn't already earned before. But after everything else that's said and done, I can understand why when you look at Greg Popovich trying to establish something for the first time, this is his first go-around with USA, Colangelo's trying to give him as much latitude as he can to build the team his way. Maybe if it was Coach K, maybe Carmelo would have had a, 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 you know, a, somebody vouching for him to come back on that team. But this is Popovich, and, and, and it's a new wave of thinking right now, and I can't fault him for that. I mean, again, Carmelo probably still could play. It's a unique team that's going to have to sign him. But, uh, no, nah, this wasn't the right fit for him right now under the circumstances, according to Colangelo. I just wonder, because I imagine – I can't imagine that there's a single person out there that truly believes Carmelo could change his ways and change his mind as far as what his role on an NBA team or on a Team USA would be right now. But for Carmelo's future, and if he wants to have a future still in the NBA, you would almost think he could go to Jerry Colangelo and he could beg and say, hey, this is going to be great for my career. You know, I want to be a leader. I want to help. I want to just you know play a role. I don't have to be the guy. I don't have to take 20 shots. I can take me 10 shots and, and make five buckets and score 12 points and, and be happy with yeah. that and be more of a leader. And if you'd see that in Carmelo Anthony, then I think teams might be attracted to him. But similar to what we saw with the short stint from Allen Iverson when he was with the Grizzlies, I don't think Carmelo has convinced or can convince anyone that he would be willing to be a role guy. I, I just I, great, I don't think it's yeah, out there. That, that's a great point, and and, and you know I, I totally agree with you. And what Popovich would say, and, and I'm not going to pretend to get in his mind, but what he would say was that you know what we got guys like that already. We have Thad Young, you know, who's going to be able to be a leader, a veteran. We have Kyle Lowry, you know, who really hadn't been on the court a whole bunch, but he's been around these guys uh, doing things in leadership ways. 
Um, you got a Brooke Lopez, you know what I mean, who's been around and was an all-star before and, and knows how to accept his role and whether he gets two minutes or, or 20 minutes, he's going to be fine with this. So he feels like those roles are already uh, pretty much taken care of. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's going to be one of those situations where, you know, Carme- I agree with you, Carmelo is a guy that he's had chances. I mean, he went to Oklahoma City and had a chance to buy in, and he didn't. I mean, he pouted when, you know, Billy Donovan – you know, wanted to bring him off the bench and didn't play him in fourth quarters. Then he went to Houston saying the same thing. Yeah. I'm going to buy in. And then what happened? That was a disaster two weeks in, basically. So, you know, again, these guys, it's hard for guys to make that kind of adjustment um, when you go from being an elite-level, frontline uh, superstar player on max contracts to being a guy that you just have to, you know, take your medicine and, and come off at the end of the bench, which is why it is so remarkable that a guy like a Vince Carter yep. has made that transition every single step of the way, and he's embraced it with class, with grace, with dignity, and that's why teams continue to give him contracts and opportunities to play in the league, whereas maybe guys like Carmelo Anthony are, are, are a little more, you know, it's a little more hit and miss uh, when it comes to those relationships that you've built on the way up. Yeah, no doubt about it. Uh, the Grizzlies and NBA schedule will be coming out on uh, Monday. What's the first thing you look at when you get the schedule in your hands? Uh, the first thing I look at, well, this year, and, and it's selfish for me, this year the first thing I'm going to look at is where are we the week of Thanksgiving because <laughs> November 23rd is my 20th anniversary, wedding anniversary with my wife, so I need to make sure I'm going to be able to, <laughs> to celebrate that. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that week of Thanksgiving is the one that I'm going to look forward to first. But other than that, man, I mean, obviously the Mike Conley comeback game uh, had already leaked um, for, you know, with the mid-November visit. That's the ESPN game. Um, he's going to come back. So that's going to be an interesting one. Um, and also, you know, pretty much what the Grizzlies are going to be doing for uh, MLK uh, celebration game. I'm always curious to see if this is finally the year where the league and, 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 the, and the teams will allow the Grizzlies and the Hawks to play sort of a home-and-home home on MLK Day, um, you know, so rotating that each year to, to really commemorate the two places where uh, King's legacy lived the longest. So yeah. those are a handful of things I look forward to first. Roser, what, uh, what's the first thing you look at when you get that in your hand? Home opener, MLK game, and when we go to New Orleans. Yeah, that's right. You you always look New Orleans. It's always look for things. the New yes. Orleans trip. Always look for the New Orleans trip if it's on a weekend. Yeah, yeah. And, and this year and we get two of them. That's we right. always get two. That's of right. Them. That's right. Michael, I, you're right. This year is a little different too because you're looking at when Mike Conley's coming back for that first time. When is Marcus All going to come back uh, in a Toronto uniform? Uh, for that first time. So those are a couple of things you look at this year. But me, every year it's the same. It's the MLK Day game. I want to know what time that game's being played, who they're playing, and what station it's going to be on. And uh, and each year I say it, and, you know, I hate saying it because of, you know, being on television with the Grizzlies broadcasts on Fox Sports Southeast, I hope every year it's on TNT because I think it needs that national coverage, and, and I think it should be a national coverage game. I wish the TNT crew did their show – from Memphis each year on MLK Day, uh, MLK Day, and I think that'd be great. And no disrespect to Pete Pranica, who does a great job, but to have a guy like a, a Kenny Smith, a Charles Barkley, a Shaq, or an Ernie Johnson in there to, for the symposium, I think would be awesome. And and I think wow. it would it would yeah. be it would be huge every year for the NBA, and it'd be huge for TNT. And um, you know that that's what I always look at and. Because there were those couple of years where it was NBA TV and you thought, seriously? I mean, they're not giving it the c- credit and coverage that it deserves on that day. Uh, so that's always, that's always number one in my book is to look at that day and see who they're playing and where it's going to be broadcast. Yeah, that's a great point, man. That, that's something that the league I really think should look into, especially you know, when, you, when you talk about the his- history and, and, and where this country is right now. Uh, when it comes to some of these race relations and things of that nature. I think it could be something that draws strength and brings a lot of people together uh, to have those kind of discussions and, and, and showcase that game. Now we've seen, Because unlike, unlike Christmas Day, my, uh, you know, Christmas yeah. Day has become an NBA holiday, and that's great. That's all about the matchups and having a holiday right. and having s- that sort of celebration of the NBA. This day, MLK Day, it should be more a celebration of the day as opposed to yeah. great basketball matchups. Yes, yes, but the thing is, they're they're putting more games on, and and, and you know, so it's a day full of games, sure. so to speak. Um, but you're right. I mean, it should be about that day. It should be about healing the nation. It should be about you know more than just the games. And 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 you're right when it comes to that part of it. And you know, the last I think the last three years, it, it's been uh, I think New Orleans uh, has been in the matchups. Uh, Chicago was in the matchup one year since I've been here, and then the Lakers. Um, 
you know, the Lonzo Ball Lakers. I think he was. I think he played when they when they came that time. Um, so you've had those three, and you know, I guess if you're going to go with one of those kind of teams, it would be intriguing if you get the Lakers. I mean, not the Lakers, but the uh, the Pelicans and the Grizzlies in that situation because you got the number one and number two overall picks yeah. possibly going at each other. So maybe that would be what can attract a, a, a TNT type national broadcast uh, for that game if you got you know Zion and Ja. Um, in, in the middle of that game, too. So it'll be the one one versus number two. And we'll see. But, I mean, that's one of the many uh, opponents that they've played on that day typically. And uh, we'll see where it, where it leads to this year. You are coming back to Memphis, right? I am coming back on a red eye tonight. Oh, okay. So I'll be back. I'll be, well, after the game, uh, catching a red eye, layover in Denver, and I'll be in, uh, in, uh, in Memphis tomorrow morning. i got to get to a... A splash pool party, man. You know what I mean? My kids got to go over to, uh, to J-Dub's party and, and jump in his pool tomorrow. So we're going to do that. <laughs> Sounds good. Michael, thank you much for you your time. You bringing Coco, man? You bringing a crew? Heck yeah, I am. I, absolutely <laughs> I am. If J-Dub's got a splash party, I am there. That's kind of a, a guarantee for sure. <laughs> Have a safe right, trip back, man. man. We'll see you next week. All right, man. All right, Michael Wallace uh, joining us uh, of Grind City Media and, of course, on Twitter at MyMikeCheck.com. All right, let's take a break. When we come back, we break down preseason football. No, stay, stick around, stick around. We're, we're going to break, really break it down. Uh, we'll do that when we return. We'll talk a little college football as well, and uh, we'll wrap things up. It's the Chris Vernon Show here on this Friday afternoon. We're back after this. Chris Stapleton's All-American Roadshow. Saturday, October 5th, FedEx Forum, with special guests no, Brothers Osborne no, and Kendall Marvel. Chris Stapleton. Tickets on sale now at LiveNation.com. Tennessee was in today's healthcare environment, it's important to be your own champion. If you've suffered an injury or have aches and pains, physical therapy can make all the difference. Choose Select Physical Therapy to get back in the game as the official athletic training and physical therapy service provider for your Memphis hustle. Select's clinical team provides the best care. Request an appointment today at selectphysicaltherapy.com. Select has more than 20 convenient locations in Tennessee. The hustle choose Select Physical Therapy, so can you. Select Physical Therapy, the power of physical therapy. Tight games and expensive car insurance are nerve-wracking. Say boo to these nerves and let our friends at Direct Auto and Life Insurance put your mind at ease. Finally, car insurance worth waving your growl towels for. Direct Auto makes car insurance affordable for everyone by offering flexible payment options, low rates, and discounts regardless of your driving history. Save more on car insurance with Direct Auto, finding a great rate and great services. Now, that's a pleasant surprise. Call 1-877-GO-DIRECT. Click or come in for Direct Auto's flexible payment options, low rates, and discounts. The Live Love Memphis group can be found at livelovememphishomes.com. They are the best real estate agents in Memphis. Jennifer Karstensen and her team, they sold over 165 houses in 2016. They're going to sell more than that this year. If you know you need to sell a house soon, if you've been trying to sell a house for a long time, if you've had a sign in your yard way too long, or you know in the future you're going to need to uh, because you're going to have to be moving or uh, you maybe even have to move out of town, get with Jennifer and her team and let them sell your house because they sell these houses for the most money possible the quickest. And that's what you want from a real estate agent. They sell for the most money possible in the quickest amount of time. A home in Bartlow is on the market for just four hours, closed in 30 days. And here's the deal. Through their proven marketing systems, they may already have your buyer. You can contact them for a list of families actively looking for properties who haven't been able to find a match. Find them online, livelovememphishomes.com, livelovememphishomes.com. Witness the unrivaled energy live the DNA World Tour. FedEx Forum, August 27th, plus surprise special guest. Get tickets now at LiveNation.com. Do not miss the Backstreet Boys experience. The new album, DNA, drops January 25th. Backstreet Boys, live. 
Welcome back to the Chris Vernon Show on GrindCityMedia.com. Brought to you by Direct Auto and Life Insurance. Live from the American Home Shield Studio inside FedEx Forum. Be sure with the shield and go to AHS.com today for your free no obligation home warranty quote. Now, back to your host, Chris Vernon. Chris is out today. He'll be back to the program on Monday. I'm Rob Fisher in for Chris here this afternoon. John Roser in the house as well. As, yes. As is the great Devin Walker in the house. I'm a town. What's going on, man? I'm a town. I'm feeling the itis right now because I just ate a fantastic shrimp po' boy sandwich. Oh, yeah? Out there from Food Truck Fridays, but I'm here. It's Friday. Man, when you walk Little food coma? Yeah. Yeah, a little food coma. A little food right coma. I'm feeling it right now. You got me looking at the clock constantly because as soon as you walked in the room, it smelled so Man. good. Yeah. <laughs> it was so. It, it, and all it you gotta do is go pick up a, what is it a little t- a little voucher downstairs? Go out there and get you free food. Yeah. So you you can choose between say cheese grilled cheeses, Ooh. or whatever that other, whatever I got. Fresh Gulf shrimp. Fresh Gulf shrimp. Fantastic. Mm. Shout out to them. That's a tough. That's yeah. a tough choice. I'm gonna have to exactly. make here today. I stood in the middle for a long time. I'd get a grilled cheese and tomato soup. Yeah, I think that's what I'd go with. Yeah. That'd probably be good. Be good. Yeah. Um, preseason football, big schedule last night. Yeah. Oh gosh. <laughs> how, how much did we watch combined? Uh, for me, uh, three minutes. Three, three. That's Twitter count. Like Twitter highlights count. Yeah, we'll go ahead and count Twitter. How much did you watch, Fraser? Um, I watched some of the uh, Giants and Jets game, and then I really wanted to see Kyler Murray. So once Kyler Murray played, and then he went out and Brett Hundley started playing, I was like, okay, I can go to bed now. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I wanted I watched Kyler Murray. I watched his first drive. That's all he did was one series. He was 6-6, six six, what, 44 yards or something like that. Um, Arizona's going to be bad, like really bad. <laughs> like, dude, no, no, no. Like, like Kyler Murray, like – as fast as that guy is, like when they had end up having to punt on his one series, he he is in the shotgun, snapped the ball, dropped two steps, and then just had to fall forward and fall down. Like his tackles are just I mean, his tackles are just dude, their offensive line in Arizona, they were horrible last year. It's gonna be really bad this year. But he can make some plays because he was able to escape a couple yeah. where those those guys get around the edges on him and he's just so fast. How he can turn out of it, and he made a couple throws. Um, so yeah, I saw his series. I saw Daniel Jones series, oh, best da- quarterback da- maybe ever. I know. Oh, hey. oh, oh, Dan Jones was Thank dealing you for the preseason. He was he was throwing darts. I mean, that's, <laughs> throwing a, that's, darts. A, that's a David Cutcliffe quarterback, man. Yeah. It's a David Cutcliffe quarterback. <laughs> hey, darts! I tell you, preseason football sucks. It really Let's does. Like like Paxton Lynch was shining last night. Let's be real. Shining, he was all pro Let's, last night. Oh, who does he play for? Seattle. Seattle. Yeah. Oh, screw him then. Might take Russell Wilson's job oh, after last night. Please night's. do. Please well, take Russell Wilson's job. He brought job. him on a please comeback. Do. They were down like, what, was it 22 to 8? Brought well, they back. won 22 14. Yeah, so well, I don't they were, yeah. Paxton, here's Paxton's numbers from last night 11 of 15, 109, touchdown, and he ran for a touchdown, which he got blasted at the end zone. Paxton, huge. Good for him. Comeback, th- comeback I, season. I also think he should start over Russell Wilson. I think it would be a great decision for yeah. Seattle. I'd yeah, love from that. From a 49ers fan. I'd yeah, love no. that. Um, yeah, it sucks, though. I'm, I'm, I was listening to the Titans broadcast a little bit last night. Just when the game starts, and Mike Keith, who's a very excitable person to begin with, he is so excited. It's football, <laughs> yeah. preseason. Here football comes, time here comes Tennessee. Yeah, yeah, here comes Mariota. Here come the Titans. And the first drive's over, and now it's like, Ooh. All right, now there's a bunch of guys I have no idea who oh, they are. Oh, yeah, no, and no. It I, just I, yeah. goes from this is exciting to this no, is hell. To, to me, yes. you, it's rookies. You want to see the top rookies. That's what you want to see. You want to see the top rookie quarterbacks. Yeah, that's I mean, about I, it, really. I don't, I don't, I'd love to see Nick Bosa, but that guy can't stop staying hurt. <laughs> uh, still he's were, still a little chapped about that. He was mad that. yesterday about I, that. Oh, I'm so, I'm so mad about that. Um, <laughs> but there were some good stories last night. Christian Wade. The, rugby, cool. the yep. rugby player from England, yep. Yep. his Dang. first ever NFL game, his first ever touch, took it 65 yards yep. to the house. That was cool. Even uh, Damian Sheely Gillespie. The guy yep. from, the, uh, from the Browns? The guy from the Browns who was sleeping outside yeah. a couple weeks ago, runs a punt return back. So you get stories like yeah, that. Yeah, there, there were some good stories, and those, that, that can help the guys to, uh, you know. You know where I can get that from, though? Twitter. Not watching the whole game. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I got it from Sports Center last night. <laughs> there you go. At the end of the night, people still watch Sports Center. I did. Well, I did last night. Yeah. What in the world? <laughs> uh, Cleveland beat Washington thirty to ten. Baker was amazing. Uh, according to reports, Baker has moxie. Was the big takeaway from oh, he that does. one? Shocker. Well, <laughs> Baker does have moxie. There's no doubt. Him doing the uh, the, the the Phil Collins. Right, air of the night. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was uh, that was viral a little bit. How about the Patriots? <laughs> you take Moxie away from that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. Oh my gosh. How about the Patriots? What the Patriots do last night? I didn't even. They write beat them the down Lions they thirty-one to three. Big, yeah. Jared Stidham started for the Patriots. Fourteen of twenty-four, one seventy-nine, and a touchdown. I will say this. The receiver they got, what's his name? Nikhil. Nikhil Harry. That dude's going to be good. Two catches for 36 yards. Jacoby Myers. He looks huge. Jacoby Myers, the big game. Six yeah. catch, six catches, 69 yards, nice, and two touchdowns. Okay. All right. And then uh, Brian Hoyer came in and, you know, just did Brian Hoyer things. Oh, 12 of 14, 147, and two touchdowns. <laughs> like. It's the oh uh, so the Cardinals Chargers game last night. It's the Cardinals broadcaster, so it's Dave Pash and whoever their uh, whoever their football guy is, because he is a football guy. <laughs> he is oh my gosh, is he a football guy? Yeah, talking about Tyrod Taylor starting for the Chargers. Tyrod Taylor, six and of six, seventy two yards, man, oh, perfection, baby. And what what did he he compared him to Russell Wilson? Oh, really? Gosh. He said, I'm not saying he is Russell Wilson, but but there's, <laughs> I think it was visions of Russell Wilson. I'm like, are you drunk? <laughs> in what in the world are you watching? Have you uh, watched the you? NFL the last like eight <laughs> years? See, that's a good thing, too, because you get these local broadcasts where oh, the yeah. only games they do are the preseason. Yes. Yeah. So they've got to be as good as they can be. Yes. Like three games. You yeah. know, and and this, bring everything they got. I'm like, have you? We've seen Tyrod Taylor start NFL games before, and we've seen Russell Wilson start NFL games. Yeah. We also saw, oh my God, Joe Webb throw 40 passes in a preseason game last night. <laughs> really? Joe 40 Webb. passes for Joe Webb. 25 or 40 for Joe Webb. Holy smokes. Dwayne Haskins, couple of picks. Yeah. And the, and one, to, six. the one to Mac Wilson, the pick he threw to Mac, the yeah. pick six to Mac Wilson was just horrible. A couple of sacks, played six series. Uh, let's see a couple of other highlights. Uh, Josh Rosen. Yeah, Josh Rosen. 13, 13 of 20. Yeah. Chosen Rosen, baby. Had a pick, though, in the red zone. That wasn't good. Yeah. yeah. And let me tell you something. His biggest plays in. Again, watching the analysis of Rosen. <laughs> oh, watch this ball. This is just a great. Oh, yeah. That's the beauty. One's like a 30-yard pass, and the dude has a guy all over him. He pulls it down with one hand. It makes an unbelievable catch. Really not the greatest throw. Yeah. And the other one was just a jump ball that the guy came down with. I mean, hey, I believe that jump- Josh Rosen, when he went to the NFL, I'm not much hey, of a believer A right jump now. ball that the guy came down with, that got Eli Manning a Super Bowl. That's true. David That's Tyree. Right, yeah, touche. Good, 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 good point. Good point. Uh, Tennessee, they beat Philadelphia 27-10. to 10. Marcus Mariota just whatever. Marcus Mariota stuff. Yeah. Just nothing to, yeah, nothing to get excited about. Nothing too special. His career in a nutshell. But mm-hmm. Ryan Tannehill. My guy. Oh, yeah. 12 of 16, 130, and two touchdowns. Titans fans. No, 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 no. I, do not, do not uh, fall in love with Ryan Tanny. Do well, it. The do other not win. fall in love with well, Ryan Tanny. Well, no, they're not. No. They're, falling, they're falling in love with Logan Woodside. <laughs> 15 of 20, 138, two touchdowns. Straight out of the AAF, playing yeah. for that San Antonio squad. Yeah. Doing work. Wiping <laughs> dust off it, baby. And then for Philadelphia, look, Carson Wentz thought he was all good. Right. With, with Nick Foles being gone. Yeah. Oh, how was it? He did not see Nate Sudfield coming at all. 10 of 18, 177, and a touchdown. But he got hurt. He got hurt, though. Too. Oh, God. Yeah, Sudfield got hurt. So that's <laughs> oh, a Philadelphia quarterback got hurt? Yeah, weird, huh? Oh, Shocker. man. Just keep Wentz on the sidelines until the <laughs> yeah, season starts. Yeah, yeah. Just don't even let don't, him walk no, out. Oh, there. they're not. They're not. He's not playing. No, he's not he may play the first series of the final preseason game. Why do yeah, they still have – how many preseason plays. games do they play now? Three. Four. They Still cut that four. Down, they got to cut that. The NBA four. at least has cut down their preseason schedule. What every team used to play eight in the NBA. Yeah. And that, that's, need, oh, it's insane. Now what it's like four? what five, five in five preseason. Yeah. Some some six, but yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 NFL is just. Will Greer for Carolina nine of 16, 77, The pick and a score. I'm not worried about Will it, Greer. Uh, Drew Locke in Denver seventeen of twenty eight. 
180, touchdown, pick, three sacks. Uh, what else you can't, we got? You can't take those sacks, Drew. Something you're going to have to yeah. learn when you're playing the National Football League. These are other National Football League football players. Yeah, yeah. And football players in the National Football League, yeah. they'll hit you. Yeah, they'll hit you. Yeah. Ask Garner Minshew. You, you yeah. got to learn that. Ask Garner Minshew. You oh, got to learn. Just, you you, you, gotta get on, Garner, you just got to get on the ground. Kyler Murray learned that. He knew the sack was coming. Just just dive forward on the ground, yeah. then they touch you. Yeah. That's yeah. it. Yeah, that's it. That's it. It's a lot easier. Yeah. Garner Minshew. Garner Minshew. His head taken off. <laughs> yeah, he night. did. Uh, Baltimore shut out Jacksonville 29 0. Why is that important? Baltimore has won 14 straight preseason games. So, what you're saying is gamble on the Ravens in the preseason? Take the Ravens yes. on the money line. Whatever Take you do. the Ravens Every, on the money line. Yeah. No matter what you do. More action tonight, more action uh, tomorrow, I believe, too. I thought the big the thing that came out of the Baltimore game, which you can see there, Greg Roman. Thing. Greg Roman's the <laughs> offensive coordinator. No, 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 no. I think this is important. Okay. The fact that uh, – because if you if you watch some of it, you would see these things. Greg Roman, the offensive coordinator for the Baltimore Ravens, he was formerly with Jim Harbaugh uh-huh. with the 49ers. Great success there with these mobile quarterbacks. With sure. Alex Smith and Colin Kaepernick. Zero rushing attempts for Lamar Jackson last night. Dude, why would you run him in the preseason? Because you're going to run him Because that's all he can do? Because you're going to run him to death in the regular season. Exactly. So let's, waste, let's not waste those attempts now, Rojo. Let's make sure we yeah, get him. You want to work made, on things in Lamar, the preseason. Lamar made a couple nice plays outside the pocket last night, which is what he's going to have to do. You get yeah. the guy outside the pocket, he can make the play on the run. He can throw it on the run a little bit. But, man, you have that guy sitting in the pocket, and it's just a disaster for him. But, again, so got to see if they – I think they're going to pull it back on Lamar running the ball in the regular season. Dude, you cannot they run him. The, you yeah. cannot have him run that much. He's going to get his head taken off. Yeah. This is the National Football League, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> I Rose feel like I belong. He's a football guy. ESPN should hire me today because I believe all their analysts, it's it's just a – it, it's like a battle to see who can call it the National Football League more. Yeah, yeah. and football players. And football <laughs> players and football teams and Dude. football coach. <laughs> He's a football like, have coach. You ever, have you ever noticed I don't like it? The Grizzlies have hired uh, Taylor Jenkins to be their new basketball coach. Oh, he's a basketball coach. He's man. a great basketball coach. Yeah. No, yeah, the teacher no. of basketball. No. <laughs> you just say he's a coach. Like, he's your coach. Nobody says, oh, it's a National Basketball Association basketball <laughs> coach of a basketball team. I don't think there's any doubt... If you were asked what's the best preseason to watch, it's baseball. And it's not even close. Spring there, training? There is no close second place. And the reason being, baseball spring training. is because you're in Florida you're or in Arizona. You're in Florida or Arizona. The weather's perfect. You're sitting in a stadium that's like a small college stadium. Yeah. And you're watching. And the guys play. Yeah. And it's baseball. But the game doesn't change much. I mean, yeah. even when the... The scrubs come in or the minor league guys come in and get their at-bats. It's still baseball, and for one game, they might get lucky and get a big hit or something. I mean, yeah. you don't well, know. So you, yeah, the you, game doesn't change, and it's it's the, the weather and the small environment. It, it's exciting to be at and to watch. Yeah, no, and you're seeing the best players yeah. in yeah. a small venue. Like, if you go to, like, back in the day, where, where were the Yankees doing? Sarasota? Yeah. So the Yankees go, yeah, the Yankees do it in Sarasota. No, they're in Tampa now. Or Tampa, yeah, okay. Tampa, yeah. So, like, dude, you walk around Yankee spring training, it's a small facility, and, like, dude, there's, like, Alex Rodriguez and Derek Jeter just yeah. signing autographs, Mariano Rivera, like, they'll just sign autographs, yeah. like, they're just yeah. chilling. And they'll go get a couple of at-bats. And yeah. yeah get to see games, you see guys running into each other. Right, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And football preseason Totally. Game. But, what, I mean, as a former season ticket holder of the St. Louis Rams, it was preseason – I mean, I didn't even go to the games. It, they, was, they were so boring. There's nobody in the crowd. You're trying to build up an exciting energy for what? Yeah. yeah for I have what? three more of these. Right. Three more of these. Players don't want to be there. <laughs> I don't want to be there. Nobody wants to be there. I, I don't know what the worst sport to watch is in the preseason. I just know baseball is the only one I think that's tolerable. Yeah, I think football may be the worst. How many people did they get to NBA preseason games? Not a lot. Like, okay, so it's not a lot. What I would say, like, if – what if the Grizzlies played their like NBA preseason games at like the Field House, the Elmer Room Field House? Probably, like, cause when like we a small to, venue. The Birmingham you know? game yeah. sold out. Like the one we went to right. and the uh, the Battle for the Iron. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that it, one. It was the. Uh, yeah, you have it. You, you still have it. Iron, the Iron City Showdown. Yeah, Iron that, City Showdown. For all of the Iron. <laughs> that, <laughs> that, that was a sellout. I don't know why it was a sellout, but I guess in Birmingham they don't have any basketball. Right. So. 
It sells out. So I, I like those neutral games. Yeah. Grizzlies yeah. played up in St. Louis a few years ago oh, against the Bulls I and mean, had a great crowd. I that remember was, was when cool. the uh, when the when, before the Grizzlies ever got here. I mean, it used to be the Bulls or the Lakers when the Lakers yeah. had Shaq and Kobe. The Bulls or the Lakers would play a preseason game here every year, and the place would be packed. The pyramid would be slammed. Yeah, but now, so yeah, those neutral cities. But yeah, that's really? what I'm saying. If you're going to hold it in your home, ta- it, like where the team actually plays, like just put it in a smaller venue or something. Yeah. Now there's mm-hmm. probably. For instance, if you televise them, it's probably difficult to do your television broadcast from the Elmerone Fieldhouse right. as true. opposed to FedEx Forum. Yeah. You know, that's, that's very technology true. problems, you know. Yeah. But yeah. No, we, and of course, three games will be on Fox Sports Southeast. But, but, I, hey. that. Yeah. but Rob, Ooh. would you prefer to have to broadcast your preseason games or would you rather just wait till the regular season to start your broadcast? Don't answer that question. <laughs> no, I, 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 because me, I know the answer for everyone else that works on the broadcast. I'll, t- I'll tell you what. A couple of years ago, I thought to myself, thank God we don't do preseason games. I mean, they're miserable. I'd, I'd come and watch a half and then be like, I, what? I just want to leave. I yeah. mean, this is nothing. And so last year, we ended up doing three preseason games. I was like, oh, my God, we're doing three preseason. Why are we doing three preseason games? I guess this was the second year in a yeah. row we had done three. Yep. Because we did the one the year before, the, the game that was played at Georgia Tech when uh, Grizzlies played the Hawks down in, on campus at Georgia Tech. So three, two years in a row. But then I quickly realized, man, no pregame show, no postgame show. All I'm doing are reports from the bench. It's easy. And I'm getting paid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What do you think, of, a, what you think about it like that? You get paid. You yeah. get paid. It made a big difference. I love preseason games now. There yeah, those go. are the best games. True. Not, not, having the, not having the pregame <laughs> and the postgame. Because I remember met Gary Darby. I'd sit up there with Gary Darby. And, like, I'd be watching these preseason games. I'm like, dude, you have to do, like, he's like, yeah, we're not doing the call-in show. I'm like, no crap, we're not doing the call-in show because I'm not going to be here. So I know we're not doing that. And nobody's calling in. Nobody's calling, nobody's calling in to talk about a preseason game. You have to game. be a maniac to call in for But he would tell me, he's like, I was like, wait, you still have to do, like, that that 30-minute wrap-up show right. on the preseason game? He's like, yeah. I'm like, like, with highlights and everything? He's like, yep. I'm like, why? Oh. <laughs> I'm like, this should be, like, a simple Hassle time throws it to you. You play one highlight from one half, one highlight from another half. Talk to you Saturday. Talk to you Saturday. <laughs> See you next time. And we're off the air. I'm like, this should be a quick, like, five to ten minute wrap up show. Yeah. This should you should have to stay on the air for thirty minutes after a preseason oh, game. Man. Well, you know, I always love to come in here with a hot take. Uh-oh. Oh, yeah. Always oh, one. always. What was mine? <laughs> the one time that was the worst hot take ever. Oh God. I. I, I it, have was, it, in my it was so bad. I can't remember, I can't remember it. it either. I just I had mean, it on the tip of my it's tongue. It's the same way. It's the same way at summer league every year. We we have Tim Bontemps on the show, and he comes up with some fire hot take. One year, it's the Minnesota Timberwolves are going to win fifty games. They didn't make the playoffs. <laughs> the next year, it was the Lakers with LeBron James are going to miss the playoffs. That one came true. I can't remember what this year's was uh, though. I think college football mm-hmm. should have a preseason, but they should do it in the spring. I think. This is where college football can make a lot of money, and we can also fix the schedules of all of college football. FC Games against FCS schools should just be eliminated. I mean, for Alabama to play an FCS team, it's just it's a waste of well, a so week. So the preseason it's a waste can of, be the bye game? stupid. So spring can be the bye spring, game? Spring, instead of playing your spring scrimmage, spring game, play an FCS team in a game. We can broadcast these games. You're going to be playing all your second string guys anyway. So the whole thought of, oh, what if guys get hurt? And yeah. You're going to be playing second string guys anyway for well, the most part. Well, what if they part. get hurt? They've got freaking five months it's to the, get ready before yeah, the regular season. Yeah. And it's the so spring. And you don't think the FCS teams would want to play? And you don't think that they'd want to play games on hitting a different team and different yeah. guys after four weeks of practice? After spring practice, your spring game is a game against an FCS school. There are enough FCS schools that you can schedule this thing out yes. that you could make it happen. Or, so go do it. Or I think you do it at – you move up. When, when did the guys start practicing? They started practicing, what, like a week ago, two weeks ago? Two weeks ago, yeah. Two weeks yeah. ago? End of July. i say after two weeks of practice, like I'd say this Saturday, you were allowed to have one preseason game against an FCS school. Yeah. And then after the preseason game, then you got two more weeks before your regular season. And then you play all FBS opponents. And then you play all your FBS opponents. Yeah, absolutely. I'm so FCS that. game, spring game – or a preseason game, yeah. I think, is needed. And it'd be perfect for television. I mean, yes. people would watch, yeah. and, and then fans could go, and you'd still get something out of it. Yeah. Absolutely. Because you know, so. fans will watch a preseason college football game. I'm with Absolutely. You. So oh, fish. I'm, I, I, I am 100% with you. And I think it's even better to do it in the spring, because if you do it before the season, and you don't care, and you call it preseason, 
if an Alabama goes out there and loses to Tennessee Chattanooga, it will affect them. Yes. It's, it's not like people are going to forget that and think it didn't happen and use the excuse of they used all their stuff. Yeah. People like, will no, still say, wait, no, you lost. lost to Tennessee Chattanooga preseason yeah. rankings. We're going to put them down at like 10 because they're not as good as we thought. Yeah. So just do it in the spring where it truly doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah. So, all right, spring game. Uh, you guys have talked about hard knocks this week. The yeah, Oakland we have. Raiders, hard knocks and frostbite and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if there was a college football hard knocks, who would who would you want to see? Uh, Alabama. <laughs> uh, I want to hear Nick Saban yelling at everybody. I want to hear how many f bombs. It's could really about drop. the coach, right? Yeah, I'm gonna yeah. go off the grid. I'll go Lane Kiffin at, at FAU. I was gonna say Mike Leach. Oh, Mike Leach would be that great. Would be fun. Mike Leach is great. You see the belly flop recently? Like yeah, a couple of, yeah, that was that'd, impressive. That'd be fun. I, you know what? I'd like to hear Dabo a little bit because he is the. He does the God thing, the Jesus thing. Right. Speaking of that guy. And you know that guy does not talk like that with his players. Right, 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 right. Get your fat mother beep on the beep, beep, beep. You Get your know behind that's on that Get line. Get your behind <laughs> on that line. You know yeah. that's how he's that's yelling how he's at guys. Uh, who would be? I know Lang because Lang seems like he he's wild, but he's not yeah. too wild. I feel like I would want to hear him like how he interacts with players. <laughs> I, Orgeron. Oh, Lord. I mean... He's, he's a maniac. Just like, oh, 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 oh. You'd really need the subtitles. <laughs> oh, yeah. You, you, you didn't you get the subtitles. Although, so I don't man. even know if they could keep up. They probably <laughs> would keep up. <laughs> be like, the subtitle guy would be like, okay. It'd be funny. The <laughs> other, <laughs> what is that? The other one, uh, Harbaugh, Harbaugh at Michigan. Eh, yeah. Harbaugh. I, I mean, because he's, no, he's, probably, he's probably sitting over there with his shirt off, drinking like a glass of milk or something. Yeah. Watching his guys play football. That's some Jim Harbaugh stuff. NBA? All right, well, I can kill the football music since we're talking basketball now. <laughs> um, NBA hard knocks would work, right? Yeah, it would be. Listen, who would I want to hear? Because each team, you have enough star power They kind of do it on NBA TV. Yeah. They did it with the Celtics last year. It right. wasn't very interesting. Um, uh, the, the Bulls. That guy's a maniac. With Boylan? Yeah, yeah, he's a maniac. He'll put you through like three or four hour practices, yeah. make you run all the time. Yeah, I'd like, like to see that. In yeah. the NBA, I feel like it wouldn't be about the coaches. It would be more so about the players. It would be more about the players, yeah. So I'll go like like a young team, like maybe like the Kings. I want to see how those guys like play around, like De'Aaron Fox and Bagley and those dudes. Or maybe even the Pelicans or the Lakers. Yeah. Those are my, probably my top three. Lakers would just be interesting every year. Yes. Because you know, see, Le- you see LeBron run everything. Yeah. Like, yeah. On camera. Or you see him because it's training camp not doing anything. Yeah. It just works better in the <laughs> yeah. NFL because there's so, there are so many stories, so many players, so many guys. And there's so many coaches. Right. Like, yeah. I mean, the Hard Knocks last year. I mean, like, I can't imagine how much footage they actually take. Oh, yeah. The, the, the Hard Knocks last year with the Browns, like with Greg Williams. I mean, right. that dude who obviously got suspended because he told his players to, like, kill Frank Gore and whatever. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Cut off the head and the body will die. <laughs> it's like. I said, what? Yeah, he's not job. <laughs> but he's like, he's like, last year on Hard Knocks, he's like, put your testicles in the A gap. <laughs> <laughs> keep, like, this is like in a team meeting. And then the, it was the big offensive line coach, the Bob, Bob Wiley or whatever. Bob, yep. what, I mean, that dude was just he was great. on another level. Like, so, there, yeah, there's because there are so many more coaches, there's so many more characters yeah. that can come from it being on the NFL and side. And like stories and everything. Yeah. 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 Like the like, Ronald Ollie story from, yeah, the, from the Raiders. Yeah. Like Last Chance You. Yeah. Like, like it's. Like I, well, did you, you've you watched it, right, Dev? Last Chance You? No, 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 no. Hard Knocks. I haven't got around you to it. You haven't got around to it yet. It's, yeah. on, my, it's on my queue. It's on the queue. Have you watched it? It's on my HBO queue. Yeah, yeah, you watched it? Yeah, Ronald Ollie. Yeah. Don't think he's got a career. No. <laughs> don't think he's got a career. <laughs> saying, don't, don't think he's got a career. <laughs> Dr. Football over here. Yeah, yeah, man. Man. I'm, just, don't, don't, I'm, just, I'm just telling you, I don't think he's got a career in the league. I don't think, I don't think he's going to make it. While I think baseball is the best preseason game to watch, I think it would be the worst sort of hard knocks thing ever. Oh, yeah. Oh, I mean, what, yeah, dude. What, what are you going to show? Just guys stretching? Fielding grounders? Fielding, Fielding grounders and... Signing no. autographs. Spitting I mean, dip. Uh, yeah. I mean, there'd be nothing. <laughs> College and, and baseball players are the worst people to deal with, anyway. So they would not be interesting. College all. basketball, you could do it. You could do a college basketball. Coaches, because coaches are the they're stars. Maniacs. Yeah, Cal. Maniacs. 
Coach Cal. Oh, yes. I mean, I mean Calipari, he's, and he's lighter than he used to be. Some of the stories I hear about him from at Memphis, I'm like, oh, my God. Yeah. And he'd do it with people in the in the room. Like, he didn't oh, care. Yeah. Oh, God, yeah. He did it in the arena when an arena would be empty. Oh, yeah. And you could hear him throughout. I mean, I'll never forget the story of him, like, standing on a stool in the middle of practice, standing on a chair. Like, the rebounders club are there. The entire media is there. And he is yelling at Sean Banks. Sean Banks, you are effing us. <laughs> it's like pointing to his butt the whole time. Calipari is. It's God. <laughs> yeah, he's a he's a legitimate yeah. man. Bruce I mean, Pearl would be a good one. Bruce, Bruce Pearl would be a good, good one. one. Yeah. Uh, uh, I was trying to think of another one. Shashevsky would be good. Yeah, give me because you give know me. he is dog cussing those guys. Oh yeah. Like, dude, he is Penny. Not. I want to see how Penny is like when closed doors. Closed doors because when you when we're in there, he's all he's just pointing. Yeah. Not doing much talking, but I guarantee. Oh, he. Dog he is those kids. yelling when the when the cameras are not on. Oh yeah, so I want to see kind of behind 100%. the scenes of what they do around there. Hundred percent. Yeah, that'd be cool. Um, all right, so with great reality shows, uh, what's your what's your go to um, reality show? Jersey Shore. Dude, seriously, <laughs> <It's> amazing. <laughs> still great. I've got I've got like fifteen of them on my DVR. <laughs> I still have them there. Uh, I haven't started watching them again, but it's like. I mean, the situation what a is guilty pleasure. The situation <laughs> has its life together. The situation does have its life. Oh, together. Wait, that, yeah, show, yeah. that show still runs? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jersey oh, Shore Family it's, Vacation. It's yeah. back. Yeah, yeah. And I think this year, in one of the episodes, they go to they come to like the South, and they've got to like go like in a boat around. And I think they're in like the swamp or something. That's so, like alligators are passing them by, and they're. I mean, they're, they're is not, Jay Wow still on the show? Jay Wow's on the show. She's still Jay Wow. She's still Jay Wow. She just got divorced. Oh. oh. Yeah. That's not mm. good. But poor, so, poor Jay Wild. Poor Jay Wild. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, she just got divorced. Uh, Snooki, Snooki doing well? Snooki's, Snooki's doing well. She's still <laughs> drunk the as hell. resident Jersey Shore inside Still, like, right still likes to get drunk. I mean, the best is Pauly D. <laughs> sure. Pauly D's still the best. Pauly D is still touring the country, DJing everywhere, fist pumping. <laughs> I mean, he's like 40 years old. He's, he's just going to live that way, man. Good for him. Do you like channel your inner John Rosa and Pauly D? No. Do you like see yourself in Pauly D? Hell no. I can't. I'm not dressing like that. <laughs> Slicking back my hair, and I'm not going to the freaking club at the age of forty, fist pumping. No. What's no. wrong with that? I'll say mine is probably right now. Last chance, you. Oh yeah. Is that considered reality? Yeah. Yeah. So I've been like deep diving in that one. I, I watched the whole season in, in one day because I loved it so much. Because really? the, the coach with John Brown at Independence Community College, he is legit. We talk about reality, like coaches going wild. He's a legitimate maniac. Really? So watching him kind of go off, see reality shows, eh, that maybe – is Ball is a reality show? No. Oh, no. Okay. It's, n- it's not based on anyone's real – it's not a real person. <laughs> <laughs> the Rock does not play The Rock, and you're now following around <laughs> – There's around NFL players in the show, though. Right? real life. <laughs> oh, my God. I mean – Ball is a reality show. <laughs> I'm – I'm back on the hills. I got the the hills back. Oh, the hills! In, back. In, oh, you know, they're, the hills. they're back now. Yeah, All they're right. back on. And uh, hey, after is, 10 is years, Law yeah. and Order SVU a reality show? Hey, no, 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 it's no, not. It's no. not. Um, <laughs> other college, I'm aware. other college football. You've been hanging out with the Tigers. Tigers make news today. They have a new athletics director, uh, Laird Veach. Yeah. Tell me everything you know about Laird. LV. His name is Laird. <laughs> His name is Laird, yeah. Um, he came from Kansas. What, last he, two years at Florida as executive associates athletic director for internal affairs, 25 years of experience uh, in athletics at Texas, Missouri, Iowa State, Kansas State. Um He's he's raised a lot of money in fundraising. I mean, that's basically that's your role that, as an athletics director. Well, that, that, well, that's his role because we know David Rudd is the one calling the shots. Right. Right, so, and he's done a lot yeah. in, uh, with Learfield Sports as well as regional vice president uh, with multimedia rights. So he's got a lot of familiarity with multimedia stuff. So that's that's good. I mean, he's got a heck of a resume. I mean, you yeah. wouldn't hire him if he didn't have a heck of a, yeah, a, heck of a resume. So. They just don't really know much about him. But yeah, um, we'll see what happens there with Laird Veach, um, the Brady McBride gone. Yeah, he uh, no surprise really. I mean, not. A, it, I wouldn't say surprise. On the surprise meter, you're probably putting it up maybe like a five because he's the second quarterback in two years to kind of dip yeah. out on the program because he didn't get what he wanted. Um, I think in, when you look at Brady White, he's been decent in camp, but it kind of scares you because if he goes down, you kind of have to look around and say, who the hell do I put in the game? Right. Because Brady was going to be the next guy. He had the, he had the charisma. Rose was talking about moxie. He had the moxie. 
he was kind of the Baker Mayfield kind of in that mold. But you see him leave, and you kind of look around like, who's going to be the backup quarterback? So, I, But what does it say about the last two years and the guys that have left? Because I, I don't think anybody last year looked at Brady White and thinks, oh, my God, I mean, we got organization a program changing guy yeah a quarterback exactly. but but i you know i think you expect he was he was good he was yeah. you know he managed the game well didn't turn it over a lot and expect him to be better this year as well but but if these guys couldn't really overtake him yeah. i i you know I, I i don't i don't think you really what do you lose Not another than they, if he goes down yeah. you hate to plan for that yeah, obviously brady's a redshirt freshman though so that's the thing he's young yeah and well the the brady that left right so he had room to grow, but when you see Brady White, he's a senior, he's the last hurrah. You wanted to have a guy kind of as your heir apparent, the guy look at, you look at four till next year. Right. So, I mean, it, for me, it's like whatever, but for Norvell, this is – also, he, had, he said the same quote the, two years in a row where a guy leaves and he's like, the quarterback room is the best he's ever been. So you look at him like, I mean, is it the best he's ever been or is it just <laughs> like a – is it like a cover-up? Right. Because he didn't mention the guy by his name yesterday or anything, so – I, it, I don't know, man. I think I just I'm I'm worried because I don't want Brady to get hurt. and You don't have anybody to look at. Right. So, I, I want we'll Brady see. to be good. Yeah. I, I think if, as from what I've from what I've watched with him, he looks. I told you guys this. Yeah. He looks more comfortable now because last year it kind of like threw him in. He was he was fighting for the job at first, so he was kind of still getting to know guys. But now he's been around guys for a year, about a year and a half. Guys are kind of comfortable with him. Like Demonte Cox, he loves him. He's put on some Memphis. You see him dancing around practice now. You didn't see that last year, so. I think being more comfortable is going to help him. So I want to see how it, how it translates on the field. The thing that stunned me yesterday, I was, I was doing some college football work and I was looking at the Tigers and their future or, and, you know, the projections for this season yeah. and preseason prognosticators and things like that. How highly they're ranked in their conference in just about every defensive category. Defensive category. The defense. The Memphis Tigers' defense yes. being ranked where they're – why? <laughs> I mean, how, how is that – it's because every, what, have we, what have we seen the last couple of years? That it's we been think? holes, man. Right. A lot of holes. But the thing about this year is there's almost everybody's back. But is that good? That's a good thing. Well, guys, I mean. Guys, it, guys are older. This has always been my thing with their, with their defense. Like, well, our defense needs to get better here. It needs to get better here. With as fast as they play on offense, it's hard to have an amazing defense. I mean, they want to score in 30 seconds. Like, it, you, That's true. So and they the, don't it, need it, to be you great. Do your you don't team, have to be great. You can be decent. You no, know, yeah, you don't average, need to be amazing. Yeah. If you just have an average, like a couple of years ago when they, yeah, they they forced the most turnovers of anybody in college football. Right. You know. But the thing with that's an too, amazing you, season. You talk about them scoring fast. The, the thing they didn't they didn't have at first because you score fast, you'd be on the field for a long time. The depth with the depth was a problem. Right. Having guys that can ship in and out. The thing now with that team is you got guys that you can put in and out in situations where if you are on the field for a three, four, five minute drive against a Navy, against a Tulane, you're not putting in scrubs behind the the TJ Carters of the world or right. the Bryce Huffs of the world, you're putting in legitimate guys. So I think that, that'll help them for when that offense is scoring in 30 seconds. Yeah, yeah, that makes a huge uh, huge change for sure. All right, the uh, Dabo, Dabo uh, Kelly Bryant situation. Um, yeah. Kelly Bryant not getting a ring for uh, Clemson's national championship. Dabo saying you got to be on the team to get a ring. It became a national outrage uh, over uh, whether or so not stupid. Kelly Bryant should get a ring. Kelly Bryant uh, says today, um, I'm not there. I'm at Missouri. I really don't care about a ring. So I guess we should all yes, just you drop do, the you story. Year old. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he probably does care. But he does care. He's, dude, a, he's an 18-year-old. He cares about a freaking ring. You <laughs> left. It's really not a story. Yeah, it's, it's not a story. So it's simple. It's, it's like, like simple you logic. Left. You, even but you, he it, helped them win four games. Helped that team win a national championship. He was sixteen and two as a starter. Yeah, you. But you left. quit the team. You but quit the team. Quit. Does anybody think that if they would have started Trevor Lawrence the first four games that they wouldn't have won those games either? Well, and here's the thing. I mean, he could have. You know, he kept his eligibility. Dabo basically told him they were making the switch, but he wouldn't play him, so he could basically keep that year of eligibility and red, counted as a redshirt year by only playing him in four games with that rule changing last year. So he would have been able to transfer anyway. Yeah. But he quit. He quit immediately. Yeah, and, he left. And wanted to move on. So I don't – yeah, I, I don't – although – if Jalen Hurts, if Jalen Hurts would have left after four games and Alabama goes on to beat Clemson in the national title, do you think they're sending Jalen Hurts one? No. No. Although, in a professional sports, if you're on the team at some point during the season and you help the team, you, you get yourself a ring. 
Is DeLon Wright getting a ring? I, 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 bet, Valen, I bet they are. Are they yeah, getting, they're, they're, they're getting Valanchunas rings. Yeah, and DeLon Wright? Yeah, they'll get, get rings. You've seen guys. CJ? You get rings for that? Absolutely. Dude, like when the Warriors traded guys, the guys that were that they've traded, they got rings. Like Barbosa got a ring. Yeah. Uh, they bring them back, they get rings. <laughs> it's just absurd. But the thing is, <laughs> <laughs> whatever. Like, but the thing is, it's not their choice, though, right? Fish is, it wasn't their choice to get traded. So it's right. like, that's okay, true. let's. That's that. That's yeah. a very it's good not point. their choice. But it's not Kelly their Bryant choice. Chose this is Kelly Bryant. This is your to decision. Out the door. Yeah. So you do live with consequences with your decision. You know? Consequences. Quit, you li- man. That's the Q word. The Q word. It's, word. it's a yeah. big word. Yeah. You got. You can't. The you make the now, decision. You live with the decision. We can't let kids be out here quitting, man. I think that's a problem with the generations. Like with my, not my generation, but the generation after mine, is kids now are able. To, if they don't like what they see, they can just. I don't like this. I'm gonna. Pull, I'm gonna Pick my ball up and leave. Right. Like you got to be able to sit in situations and deal with it. Get better so you can move ahead. The other thing, well, the that's what we did in our day. Exactly. Back in your yeah. <laughs> well, well, the, well, the other thing with that, and this is why it gets killed about with college sports, is the fact that the coaches can pick up and leave whenever they want. Sure. Yeah. So that's that's why it is like, why can't the players? Yeah. You know, because the coaches it, can leave when they want. Because they're at a school for higher education. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's why they're there. Higher education. Go ask how many kids. Never mind. Middle, I'm some, middle, I'm, I'm gonna get, I'll get lower to middle <laughs> education. Education. Yeah. The, the, the hours they practice, opposed to how many hours they spend in the classroom, there's no way in hell higher education is actually happening. I know. It's crazy. It's crazy. It's crazy. Wow. All right. Well, that's all I got today. We oh, I did have college football stuff for you. Oh, please. Oh, in Lord. 2020. Oh, that's right. That's right. I forgot yeah. about that. Uh, Roser, I'm excited I, for this. Devin, I don't know about you. I am not a – and it always bothers me. Like the SEC and college football coming out with their schedule for next year. Already? Right now. I'm excited about what's about to happen starting next week yes. with college football getting yeah. started. So I don't care about schedule. Roser texted me well, last night and said, hey, man, 2020 schedule's looking good. <laughs> There's one loaded week. And I said – Dude, I'll ask you about it. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a year and a month you can away. Handle that. You can it's that a down. year and a month away. But Rosa, well, the, the SEC they they released their entire schedule, right. so it got me looking. I was like, I'm gonna go see and see if some of these other Power Five teams have released parts of their schedule. And sure enough, some of their games that are already have been scheduled years in advance, the right. conference schedules just haven't been released. September 12th of next year, mark it down. Check it out. <laughs> oh, year in advance, baby. LSU, Texas, Kentucky, Florida. Auburn, North Carolina, Arkansas, Notre Dame, Missouri, Vandy, Mississippi State, NC State, Washington State, Houston, Penn State, Virginia Tech, Ohio State, Oregon, Oklahoma, Tennessee, Memphis, Purdue. Because I'm not going to forget about that a year from now. I can't. There are a couple in there. I can't believe you threw in there. Oh, like I the mean, Vanderbilt game, yeah. Vandy, oh, Missouri. Yeah, I can't. Yeah, yeah, I <laughs> what, what, the NC State game. Who the NC State? Mississippi play? State, NC State. That's hey, a good get game. Out of here, man. Mississippi State, <laughs> on, NC State. It's a good game. El, but do, do you get LSU, Texas, Oklahoma, Tennessee, Ohio State, Oregon, and Penn State, Virginia Tech? That's good. It's loaded. We're that not talking, is, we're not that is a loaded week. Not, not 2019. We're talking about. No, 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 no. The week is loaded. September 12th, 2020. September 12, 2020. By the way, starting uh, <laughs> fever in two weeks, two weeks from yesterday, we got a new show here on Grind City Media. Yes. yes. Looking forward to it. Lang Whitaker and myself, the odds couple. Yes. Uh, we'll be breaking down all the football action from the SEC, the Tigers, some premier top 25 games. Uh, when the NFL gets cooking, we'll be doing some NFL games as well. We'll take it all the way through the Super Bowl, uh, where we will be uh, broadcasting and handicapping the games and trends and all of those things, like that great nugget I had earlier about Baltimore winning 14 straight preseason games. Yes. We'll have stuff like that yes. uh, on the show. We'll have a very special guest, Bruce Marshall, uh, who handicaps games as well as anyone I've ever heard in my life. He's going to be handicapping the games with us as well. And uh, we'll hear from the coaches, and uh, we're going to do that. It'll be every Thursday uh, here on Grind City Media following the Chris Vernon Show. We will have the, uh, the odds couple. So looking forward to that. Lang and I will have that. That will be starting in two weeks. Lang's just so. going to pick Georgia. Lang's going to hate me. <laughs> I've changed my picks, Roser. Oh. I do have Missouri going 10-2. and two. Oh, my God. Missouri football? Football, 10-2. and two. Yeah. Shout out to Kelly Bryant. Shout out to Kelly Get Bryant. Get you a ring, my guy. I think the best over-under – I'll just leave you with this. Best over-under picks. I know you had yours. Yours were Arkansas, Tennessee, 
And was there Missouri? A third? Missouri. Uh, Missouri. And then I'll, I also like the Mississippi State under seven and a half. Okay. I, I love like Arkansas under five and a half. I mean, they've lost 20 of their last 26 games, and they're not yeah. good. They're not good. They're not good. No. Uh, I like them under five and a half. I love Missouri over eight and a half. I really do. They've won 14 of their last 18 in the regular season. Their schedule is just primed to win their first eight games before they even suffer a loss. I love Kentucky under six and a half. I know yeah, that's a I mean, huge drop from lost, 10 to 6. They, they lost a lot, a lot, lot of man, guys. Man. Yeah, I, I, they lost like the I two best players in the history of their school. Other than my guy, RIP. Jared Lorenzen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hefty left. Well, that's just say, like Benny Snell and Josh Allen are two of the greatest players to ever play football yeah. at that school. Yeah. So I think they're in for a big, big drop. Also, uh, I think the best bet for the SEC championship is the Florida Gators. At plus Dude, they lost a lot of guys too, though. Like they all transferred. <laughs> yeah, but what Dan Mullen did with a terrible quarterback last year is stunning. Yeah, I and mean, if he's he, any he better is, again this year. Dude, Mullen amazing. is amazing. Yeah. He is, man. Mullen's great. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Lang's going to be mad at me because I've changed my Eastern Division And champion. if you haven't gotten on it yet, Alabama currently, I think, is minus 33 against Duke. Get on that before it gets to 40. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my biggest thing with that is how is Duke going to score? Look, That's what I I'm like. Alabama will score every time they get the ball. Like yes. Duke is not stopping Alabama from. Alabama's gonna score whenever they want. Yes. Tua will play a half. That could be the way Duke covers, and Alabama puts in third strings, Bring fourth strings Daniel at Jones the end of the, the game for the season opener. Yeah, <laughs> maybe, yeah. They could, maybe they could do that. <laughs> um, yeah. So the odds couple get started in a couple of weeks. Also, uh, just a personal note: uh, next week uh, at Holy Rosary School in Memphis is the Memphis Runs for Autism 5K. Yeah. Uh, you were out there last year, right? I was. Yeah, I was. Yeah. Hey, yeah. I need to come run. Yeah, come on out and run and uh, join us. Memphis Runs for Autism 5K. Uh, you can check it out online. Go to Holy Rosary's website or go to the Memphis Runs for Autism, uh, dot com, or uh, you can even go on Twitter. If you check out my Twitter, at the Fish Nation, i uh, got a link to it as well. If you want to sign up to run next uh, week, uh, the Memphis Runs for Autism 5K over at Holy Rosary, and uh, you can donate money. If you don't want to run, you can donate and help a great cause uh, over at Holy Rosary. My son's starting there on uh, Monday, so look forward to that. Good luck. Cool, man. Good, good luck nice, to him. Nice. School starting Monday. All right, that's going to do it uh, for us here today. Vernon's going to be back on the show on Monday. Thanks to Brad Jones for joining us, New Grizzlies assistant coach, a little earlier today. By the way, I didn't. Even, what is Chris doing today? Golfing. I don't know. Yeah, at the golf. It's, it's like a charity yeah, golf a charity thing. That's what golf I thought thing. it was. It's yeah. like a charity golf thing. Remember that's what I thought it was. For Verno. Oh, good that's for what you. I, that's what I thought. Someone asked me. They're like, where's Verno? I was like, golf or something. Because like, yeah, I couldn't remember. Me. I was like, I have no idea. I mean, yeah, I, I think know. he was talking about it the other day, but I was kind of like on my deathbed sitting here, like not really paying attention <laughs> to anybody. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> like, right. But I figured it was golf. Uh, Thanks to Brad Jones. Thanks to Michael Wallace for joining us from Vegas as well. Thank you, Devin. Thank you, Roser. Thank you, Kimball. Thank you, everyone uh, for watching here today as well. Vernon's back on Monday. I'll be back with the odds couple coming up in a couple of weeks with Lang Whitaker. I'll be joining Verno to talk more about that in the upcoming weeks as well. Have yourself a great, great weekend. And the Chris Vernon Show will be back on Monday afternoon here on Grind City Media. Just a full-growing man